Hello and welcome to the Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast, episode 112, October AMA. Questions from the crowds, live from Hamilton, I'm Sean, and with me, the Tabletop Bellhop himself, Mo T. I am the Tabletop Bellhop, your cardboard concierge, the RPG maitre d', answering your gaming and game night questions and striving to make everyone's gaming experience better. Let me put my years of gameplay, event organizing, and game night hosting to use for you. I'd like to welcome everyone here in the lobby on Twitch. You can join us Wednesday nights, 9 p.m. Toronto, New York time at twitch.tv slash tabletopbellhop. It is the last Wednesday in October, just getting really close up on the Halloween. Being the last Wednesday of the month means it's time for another live Q&A. So tonight, during our Ask the Bellhop segment, we will be answering questions from the lobby, our chat room here on Twitch live. After that, we got a couple puzzle solving games to review. Up first is going to be Chronicles of Crime 1400 from Lucky Duck Games, followed by The Shining, Escape from the Overlook Hotel from The Op. As usual, we'll be finishing off with our Bellhop's Tabletop Week in Review, and that I expect to be pretty short due to not really getting in a lot of gaming this past week, and most of that being the games we're going to be talking about in the reviews anyway. For those of you here live, you can start getting your questions in the chat now so that we have some ready to go when we get to our Ask the Bellhop segment. We love interacting with our listeners and viewers. Each week, we're going to highlight some of our interactions with you fine folk. We'll highlight some uh, feedback we received, comments on our content, maybe some gaming discussions we've been part of in the past week. We want to share what people are saying, both positive and negative. We appreciate your comments and suggestions, and if you'd like to let us know something about the show, send your feedback to mo at tabletopbellhop.com and or sean at tabletopbellhop.com. That's S-E-A-N. You can also hit us up on social media, where I can be found everywhere as tabletopbellhop, one word. And I can be found as darkelflx. Well, we're going to start off tonight with a comment on our Robotech RPG Tactics unboxing video. Uh, and I, we didn't get the name in there, so I'm not sure who this one's from, but... Oh, my bad. They, they I say, apologize for that. This style of model with lots of parts for just one miniature, that's very old school, where nothing else might have been possible. Looks like 80s or 90s. <laughs> Is it known why they did this complicated? Besides of that, the miniatures do look good, if you manage to build them, that is. Well, thanks for the comment. It was cataclysmic something. I got the cataclysmic part. Uh, I was over on YouTube, so someone's uh, YouTube username. I do apologize for not getting your last name, cataclysmic. Uh, I was able to confirm my suspicions during the unboxing video that what Robo te- what what Kevin Symbiata and his brilliance at Palladium decided to do was instead of hire a sculptor and create Robotech models or pay someone to do so, they would take original Bandai model kits, the 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 scans, the the plans for Bandai model kits, and shrink them down to miniature scale and then just produce those. It's insane. Like this is a, a crazy way to create 28 millimeter or 38 millimeter miniatures. Like just I, I am so baffled by the thought process here that they thought this was the way to go all right well next up a couple of positive comments on a picture mo shared of our gloomhaven actual play setup part uh parton prince said this is awesome you guys have kept the space nice and clean love it doesn't feel like it's taking over the table and wandering rogue 67 commented it looks like from ollivander's wild shop love the shelves one <laughs> shop one shop, yeah. That's a Potter reference there. Thank you both for the comments. Uh, we've made a number of improvements to our setup in the last couple months, and I think it really does show in the video quality as well. That's just part of why I was snapping the pictures. I know we made it really jealous. Uh, Tori and Kat are like, we can't wait to play again. It looks so much better. They're going to come in, and they, they don't realize just how dark our basement has been for the last 10 years and how much brighter it can be. There is more to come, too, because we are hoping webcams start to become back in stock with everyone still uh, video conferencing, working from home and homeschooling. It is really hard to get a good brand name webcam. There are some out there. They're just not of a quality I'm willing to take a risk on. Yep. Well, next, some comments on our great talk of great two player games that are currently in print. Chris Groff wrote, Shadespire is excellent. I was Mm -hmm. surprised Marvel Champions didn't get a call out. And Phil Hatfield commented, Star Wars X-Wing died with a resounding thud in this town when they went to second edition. 
I kept my ships and will only play with first edition rules. Well, thanks, Chris and Phil. Uh, first off, I'll go to Chris's comment. I was pleasantly surprised by Shadespire. I know Sean was as well. We weren't expecting something that good from a, a Games Workshop game. And I haven't had that much fun with a Games Workshop miniature based game in a long time. Now, nothing against the big box Warhammer games. It's just that was a way too expensive and way too time consuming for me to get into. Since having kids, I haven't tried to collect an army at all, which is probably a good thing. And it was nice to have something so quick and accessible that was still a good game. Now, as for Marvel Champions, this did seem to be a really big hit, but it was like right at the end of last year, start of this year, and I never really got to try it before we all started going into quarantine. I have heard good things about the game, and what I'll do is I'll make sure I toss that into the show notes for anyone else who wants to check it out. Now, as for Phil's comment about X-Wing, I fully expected that to happen here. Like, that is what happened to me. I bought in pretty heavy into X-Wing First Edition. Um, I kept at it mainly actually to get free shipping on Amazon. Whenever I was like really close to the free shipping threshold, I would just buy another ship and that's what would get me over. And that was my excuse to buy X-Wing ships. But I never played that much because it just wasn't that big a deal here in Windsor. There weren't a lot of people playing. Then second edition hit and all of a sudden everyone's playing where personally I'm like, no, I'm packing up my stuff because it was over $150 US for me to buy the three upgrade kits required to use all my models. Right. And yes, I probably could have went, I'm just going to play Rebels or I'm just going to play uh, the Empire or whatever and only bought one kit, but I want to be able to use everything I own. So for me, I quit playing, but man, did it take off. Like there is a local game store here that opened because of the local X-Wing community where uh, Solon opened up tabletop Renaissance basically to sell his X-Wing friends, X-Wing chips. Like, like he basically was able to open a game store just based on the local X-Wing community. Now they since expanded, but X-Wing is still huge there. Interesting. Well, finally, we've got an important question about Gloomhaven Jaws of the Lion, mm -hmm. which came from our article that compared Jaws to the original Gloomhaven game. Daniel Wong asks, is the app also compatible with Jaws of the Lion? A great question, Danielle. Uh, assuming you're talking about the very popular Gloomhaven Helper app from Spine, the one that we used to use for our live streams, then yes, that app does have all of the monsters and scenarios from Jaws of the Lion. Now, I do have to say I haven't personally tried it with Jaws. Um, I, I, I don't know how it uses, like, like there's monsters that overlap both games, how it would know which one you're using. Maybe it's based on which scenario you've chosen. Um, we talked about using it for our live streams, but you know what? Jaws is just that little bit simpler. Like there tend to only ever be two monsters in play at a time. And there's a little less to track. There seems to be less status effects going on. Plus it's only two of us with Deanna and I playing. So there's less things to track that way. Plus we just got it set up. So on YouTube, you can have me and Deanna in the picture while we're playing and it would, we lose a chunk of valuable screen real estate if we did start having the app on the screen. Though I do kind of miss it sometimes. So I don't know. To, to be honest, if any fans out there who watch our Gloomhaven streams have an opinion and actually prefer our older videos where you could see the helper so that you can see like what monster cards come up and stuff like that, we'd be willing to put it back on. We can find some other place to put our smiling faces. <laughs> All right. Well, that's it for this week's comments. Thank you to everyone who shares, comments, and interacts with our content. A few quick announcements before we continue. As the fall colors change, remember we lose an hour of gaming on November 1st. It's true. Hey, we won't be in the middle of an extra life this year when it happens, so we won't have to game for 25 hours. Though we always did anyway. Like, I always complained about, oh, it's going to be a 25-hour event. Meanwhile, we're up like 36 hours. Cause well, we yeah, because it's 10 a.m. one day until like 6 p.m. the next day. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> we always did way more than that. Though we, we did tend to get naps in there. All right, the Tabletop Bellhop newsletter. I mention it every week. I'm going to keep mentioning it every week because it is the best way to keep track of everything we put out. Once a week, I send out an email and it recaps all the content we released the week previous. All of our unboxing videos, any of my master lists we updated, any news, any reviews, whatever we put out, it all goes in that newsletter and goes out to those who subscribe. You can sign up by going to Tabletop bellhop.com and subscribing right there in the sidebar or go over to newsletter.tabletopbellhop.com all right speaking of our gloomhaven live stream starting this friday assuming we actually play and there's nothing that gets in the way of that we are going to move back our start time by half an hour we're gonna start instead um at nine instead of 8 30 
because as the kids get older, they're staying up later and we're having a real hard time, honestly, getting ready by 830. Like it's it's close every week. Last week, if anyone paid attention to the stream, I think I had the we're just getting set up thing going for about 10 minutes because I was still like getting out of the shower. So <laughs> we're just going to push that back to the same time as our podcast recording start time. And everything else will be staying the same. We'll still be at twitch.tv slash tabletop bellhop. And you can still help us decide what path to take when we get multiple options of which way to go. Now, I do apologize for changing things kind of midway through, but this works out much better for Deanna and I. Now, if we're ever able to game with Tori and Kat again, we're going to reevaluate this time change if we ever do switch back to playing the full Gloomhaven again, because I know 8.30 was better for them. But for now, 9 p.m. Eastern New York, Toronto time on Thursday, no, Friday nights, sorry, Friday nights. All right. All right, now that Hogwarts battle is being carried by Owl to somewhere, I think it was in Indiana, somewhere down south, we figured it was time for another giveaway. This time around, we want to reward those of you who follow at Tabletop Bellhop on Twitter, as well as give an incentive to those who don't follow us yet. In addition to that, we're also going to have ways for people to earn bonus entries by following us on social media, subscribing to our YouTube channel, checking out our Facebook page, etc. And if you already do all these things, which I'm sure you do, those are just like free bonus entries. So what are we giving away this time? All right, this time around, we're going to offer up my review copy of Animal Empires from Half Monster Games from way down under in Australia. This is a three to eight player. Yes, the box says two. Shh. It's a three to eight player empire building card game featuring some fantastic anthropomorphic artwork and one of the best boxes I've ever seen a card game come in. Like I'm tempted. I'll just send you the cards. I'll keep the box and put some other game in there. This contest will run for three weeks ending on the 18th of November, just in time for it to show up in time for the holiday. Due to the cost of shipping, the contest will be open to residents of US and Canada only. Now, to enter, all you have to do is head over to tabletopbellhop.com and check out the pinned post. On that, you will find a raffle copter widget for the contest, and that is live now. Also, if anyone uh, notices any issues with the raffle copter uh, log yes. in, let us know right away. There have been issues in the past, and we're ha but uh, we don't. If we don't find out about them, we can't fix them for you. So, let us know, and good luck. Well, we're here to answer your game, gaming, and game night questions. You can send your questions to questions at tabletopbellhop.com or head over to tabletopbellhop.com and click on Ask the Bellhop. Uh, social media works too. We're everywhere as Tabletop Bellhop, one word. Now, the best way is for questions to come through the website. That way they get logged and I get an email notification and I get a little thing on my WordPress that spins at the top and they don't get missed. I'm still not going to say no to a question asked anywhere else either. It is the last Wednesday of the month, which means it's time for another AMA. Tonight, we're going to be fielding questions from the lobby, our chat room here on Twitch. All right. One thing I'd like to start doing with these AMAs, just to try to um, uh, make the shows a bit more focused so that we're not talking about 20 different things in one episode. And honestly, to make them easier to promote. So one of the things we do with each of these episodes, we convert them into a YouTube video. And it's really hard in a whatever 150 character YouTube title to talk about 18 different things we talked about in an AMA. So we're going to try to stick to a smaller handful of questions and spend a bit more time on each of them. Now that might involve like looking some stuff up on Google or actually taking the time to look up stuff on Board Game Geek. And I think that's going to be worth it so that we can actually deep dive the questions a little better and give you better quality content instead of just throwing out an answer to something quickly. Now, I'm not saying you can't ask anything. It is an AMA. I'm not saying we're going to throw stuff out. Maybe we'll fire off some quick questions that we won't SEO, right? But we're looking for, you know, three really good topics we can cover for tonight. All right. Well, since uh, we haven't got anything in the lobby yet, I'm going to start off with a question we got from Sean P. Kelly last week that we All talked right. about bumping to this week for the AMA. So we, uh, we've chatted about Kickstarter many a time on this show. We've even done full Kickstarter episodes, mm -hmm. but... What on Kickstarter right now has you excited? All right. So we talked about this during the coffee break. So the number one game for me that's being kickstarted right now isn't even on Kickstarter as far as I'm concerned. It is on Hasbro Pulse, which is Hasbro's own internal crowdfunding, whatever the heck. I don't think it's actually crowdfunding at all, to be honest. I think it's Kickstarter's way to set up a pre-order system because uh, I'm pretty sure there's nothing that doesn't ever get funded there. Like, I think it's just their way of 
building up hype. And that is the new edition of a classic, which is Hero Quest, which I don't know if people on the stream can see, but my copies are up there behind me, um, just above my head there. Hero Quest was a game that, unlike many people who are like, oh, I played that growing up. Well, I, I was I was pretty grown up by the time I was playing Hero Quest. It was a game that actually I played with Deanna when we were dating. We actually played through the entire campaign together. So that's always had a special place in my heart due to that. Plus, I love the game. It was based on the Warhammer universe, and I was a big fan of the Warhammer universe. And it was such a simple system. And it was a game that was easily expanded. And it was one of the things that got me into dungeon mastering fantasy style games games is making my own hero quest scenarios so hero quest on hasbro pulse yes i realize i'm cheating because it's not on kickstarter but is is my number one now i guess saying that my kids have probably worked with deanna and there may be a copy of that coming at christmas well it won't be coming at christmas because it won't be funded but i'll probably get notification that something was funded there but that is probably the one and i don't know i gotta admit i debated it it is a lot of money when the project first launched, they were doing ridiculous things for Canadian shipping. They thankfully fixed that now. I think it's only 30 bucks for the whole thing now, but they were going to charge more than the game for shipping. And I don't know, like they are literally reprinting the game with a new set of artwork. And I got to admit, part of me wishes Restoration Games would have gotten the license. And what's weird is Restoration Games registered a trademark for Hero Quest. So I don't know if maybe something else was happening or where what happened there. Or maybe that's why Hasbro's rushing this out is to assert their IP ownership. I don't know. But I kind of would have liked the modernization. But then there's enough nostalgia for the original and I had fun with it that it part of me is also like, nah, you know what? That's better than ruining it. I would rather have what I played before improved slightly than a brand new game I don't actually enjoy. So I, I was on the fence for a while about buying it myself and then i decided to sit back and like you know what this would make a great christmas gift this i'm hard to shop for i know i'm hard to shop for so if you guys want to do that do that that'd be cool and if i don't get it i'm not gonna be that upset either yeah no that's absolutely valid and i think everyone had hoped that that was going to come out on kickstarter uh through restoration games mm. um but licenses do what licenses do uh i've got two active games backed on kickstarter well yep. two and a half three uh <laughs> studies in sorcery caught my eye okay. um i know the marketing the marketing hook of it pushed me a little bit uh it's not a fancy game it's not a big game but it's a solid card based game and again I'm, I'm a sucker for card based games for sure uh and then on top of that i did fall into the trap and uh and did give them my money and i'm not going to be upset is uh the hoop gods and the second printing of Red oh you gods. did do it nice. i did end up uh i was actually one of the ones who helped push them into their first day um, nice at the at the at the you know 11th hour 59th minute i'll push them over their uh their tar their target for that first day um and they've already gotten a couple of stretch goals on that so that's wow. great all uh, right another one i'm tempted by because i don't know if sean specified gaming kickstarters or not i not, don't know if he did but just in case he did no, i think he just said what's on kickstarter right now got simon stallenhog the man who invented mm -hmm. tales from the loop has the labyrinth this is his newest art book and i didn't even realize it that he became famous because of kickstarter the original tales from the loop art oh. book that spawned the tv series the role-playing game and four other books and like a, a novels and comic books are coming and everything else was originally a kickstarter the this artist was unknown before launching tales from the loop the original on kickstarter and he's doing his new one called the labyrinth which definitely seems to, again, be progressing the storyline with older people. So that seems to be a progression. So Tales of the Loop was kids. Things from the Flood was uh, like teenagers, high school. Whereas every stuff for the, uh, the Labyrinth looks uh, a little more aged. Right. And it looks fantastic. I, I This is one of those, if I had spare cash to spend on art books, this would be one I would buy. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I don't have anything else really that I'm going for. I know actually uh, the giveaway we're doing from uh, uh, the folks at um, Half, Monster. Half Monster have just started a new one. I did take a look at it. It is interesting. It is a superhero based card game. Um, and I, I I hovered my finger over the button for a long time. Uh, yeah. It's it's interesting. It's really cool. Um, honestly, I... I'm sad to say this. Uh, I'm picky enough now that the art was what drove me away. Wow. Um, it's it's an interesting game, but the mechanics alone aren't enough. 
if it had something better in the way of art on it, I probably would have given, uh, uh, dove on it. Um, but I could do those mechanics myself somewhere. Like it's not, mm-hmm. it's, it's, uh, it's very much, um, uh, and, uh, a, a game like the, um, you're, you're making up a story with cards basically. Okay. So you, you, you generate a superhero with superpowers and a, uh, a victim who needs saving and you do a sort okay. of story based off of that, but it's really kind of simplistic art and not, not in a great stylized simplicity, just kind of yep. simplistic and, I ended up not. Isn't this like, like, trust me, I'm a superhero or something? Yeah, that's What's the one. Yep, trust me, I'm yeah, a superhero. Yeah, trust me, I'm a superhero. Yeah, which is actually a re-theme of an earlier game they made called Trust Me, I'm a Doctor. Yep. Though this looks, um, have less questionable content, we'll just say. Well, they do have two uh, expansions. There is a, an option. You can get the the base game plus two expansions, one of okay. which is Silly Heroes, and the other one is Sexy Heroes. Yeah, see? So they have that option in there. I don't know. There, there was there was stuff with like experimenting on children in Ooh, that's the not, no, other no. one, and that's, I was like, no, sorry, no, that's not okay. And plague doctor stuff, like like nasty things people did to each other back in the medieval times. Yeah, that I don't yeah. think it should be part of levity, in my opinion. But to each their own. Yep. One I thought you might be interested in is Urban Shadow Second Edition, as far as RPGs that just launched. It was either today or yesterday. Oh, see, I've been off uh, Twitter for a couple of days, so. Ah, no, this one just launched is a big deal. It's Magpie Games. Urban Shadows is considered one of the best, um, what do you call it, urban fantasy RPGs oh, out there. Oh, and they did well. Is... Oh, yeah, they're, wow. they're doing fantastically well. Interesting. I will definitely. This, this is the one exploding in my inbox. Right. Because I, I don't know if people realize this, but on Kickstarter, if you haven't used it before, you can follow people. And then you can see everything they back. And well, you know what? Every few minutes, I actually get a <laughs> notification saying someone's back Urban Shadows second edition. Right. Now, me, I'm, I'm on the fence. I I am uh, I like some urban fantasy and some I don't. So, yeah, it, it, it's it's kinda... if, if we if it can recreate the novels of Charles DeLint, I want to play it. But this looks <laughs> like it's going more for a Harry Dresden. But it's not that I hate Dresden, but yeah. I prefer more of a, a Faye are real and you know, giants exist, but people can't see them to gritty noir solving mysteries. Well, they've, uh, they've unlocked just about everything. They've only yes. got two more stretch goals to go. Um, that's, that is tempting and it's not yeah. a bad price for the, uh, for the deluxe. No, I um, thought, I thought it was very reasonable. I thought you might be tempted by this yeah, one if you had, if you had seen I'm definitely it gonna, I'm definitely going to take a look at that. Um, I'll have to watch uh, again. I'm, I'm not a big fan of digital edition. I love my, I love paper. my books. I love yep. paper books. If I'm nope. going to run an RPG, even if I'm going to run an RPG online, I still want to have sat there and read the book uh, nope, and held it. the book and, you know, gone outside and sat in the back patio with, with a book in my hands. Um, so, so that's, that's a big thing for me. I, I'm, I've got a few RPGs that I've got in digital format oh, yeah. and I look through them and I just, I don't get inspired the same way I do with a book. Now, that being said, I did back uh, Roll, the digital yeah, online system. Uh, and I haven't checked in lately. I, I do have an early access uh, to it. Um, okay. And actually, I should bring you into something just so we can both take a look at it and be aware of it. Um, it's still very basic, but they are rolling out more to it bit by bit. Uh, and it looks to be a solid uh, you know, contender up against places like Fantasy Grounds and Roll20. Mm-hmm. And it's aimed more at the storytelling uh crowd as opposed right. to the D D fifth ed or uh you know yep, ACC yep. crowd all right speaking of the sore the the storytelling crowd i do have to bring up one that most of my twitter is going nuts for and that is thirsty sword lesbians yes. cross swords and fall in love with this tabletop rpg by K- april kit walsh celebrating queer love and power powered by the apocalypse sword fighting lesbians Yep, that yeah. I got to say, that's one I want to back just to support. I don't know if it'd be my game or something I'd ever want to play, but this just to me is something that I think is fantastic. It looks amazing. The artwork looks great. The layout looks fantastic. Everything about this game looks fantastic. I just don't know if it's the kind of story I want to play in, but I'm. this is one that, again, if I had the spare money just to support other people, I've been tempted to do that. I'm like, I'm going to set up a Patreon where people give me money just to support other people's Patreon so I can take the time to find who to support. I'm like, here, I'll, I'll take good care of your money. I'll give it to the right people. And that's that's Thirsty Sword Lesbians is one I would definitely support in that case. And interestingly, uh, the digital, uh, or the, the cyber flirt on uh, Thirsty Lesbians, $30 gets you all the digital documents, including 
the Roll20 campaign module. So yep. for those all digital gamers, they, they've thought about you in advance uh, and you are good to go right there, which is nice. And then just a couple quick honorable mentions. Um, one I am most curious about, but I wouldn't back myself, is Frostpunk. This is a very impressive looking board game, but I worry about its ability to deliver. And it's the first created by Glass Cannon Games. It's an overly produced, you can tell that the, someone saw Dark Tower was coming out because there's a tower in the middle of the board and there's 3D scenery. And this one, I, I'm going to wait. I want to wait for reviews and I want to wait and see if it's $20 on Amazon six months after it kickstarts or if this becomes the next, you know, um, Gloomhaven that gets a second printing through Kickstarter. It's not one I'm willing to take the chance on, but I got to say it looks pretty cool. Yeah, absolutely. And there's there's a lot of I mean, well, there's always a lot of games on board on on Kickstarter. Yeah. Um and there are a lot of seriously questionable games on Kickstarter oh, yeah. these days. Um, always. Uh it's interesting. I I I shared something with Mo the other day. I got alerted to a accidental start of a Kickstarter project. That had uh, they'd accidentally hit their launch button before they planned to, and while the art on the cards actually looked really solid, uh, it was okay. well laid out. Yep. The iconography was nice. Everything else about the Kickstarter page sent up giant red flags. Um, it was, I mean, they were just like they, it was a red flag. They, yeah. the, the whole thing should have just been a waving red flag. <laughs> it, was, it was kind of horrifying, and 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 they couldn't have gotten my money because of the way the Kickstarter page was laid out. Now. We know they launched early. Maybe someone whose English was not their first language had set up the rough page and the editor was going to go in. I hope so. <laughs> but uh, as it was, when it when it did that pre-launch, it kind of scared yeah. me off them completely. Uh, Just jumping back to our lobby right now. So Jeff's a little salty about Urban Shadows and I totally get it. Has the first edition, hasn't played it yet. That always sours me on a game that has happened to me a number of times, even with board games, miniature games. I can't believe every time, if, if anyone out there wants a new edition of War Machine to come out, just let me know because I'll decide to get into the game and go buy a unit. And then within a week, they'll go down to a new edition. I'll buy the core rule book. It'll show up. I'll start reading it. And then I will see the news within a week, within seven days. It has happened twice so far. Within a week of deciding, that's it. My friends are playing this game. I'm going to play this game. I'm going to buy it. You can see those. Those are over my shoulder too. You can see a Menoth army box right back there. That was the last time when I bought that. That's when Prime Mark II went away and the newest edition came out. And I get it. I totally understand getting like, oh, why are you doing a new edition? Now, from what I understand from Urban Shadows from, from the indie RPG scene is that it was one of those, it just barely made it the first time. Like it, it kickstarted, it did pretty good and it has fans, but now it has lots of fans. And now is their chance to turn it into what it should have been in the first place. And I kind of get it. Plus it's indie support, indie developers, any indie developer don't have a regular infusion of cash. So I don't mind supporting them again. Like um, for example, there's a new edition of Ironetta coming out. That'll be the third, but I think that's fantastic. And I'm more than willing to support Ironetta yet again. It seems like they're doing a lot of fixes to it and sound, things that sound awesome. And the second edition sounded better than the first edition. So, yeah. And, and to be fair, I mean, those are games, especially, you know, Ironetta, uh, as much as we support their work, they haven't sold a lot of copies. Exactly. So yes, yeah. while some people may be a little bit upset, the majority of us are just really happy to see it get into more hands so that mm -hmm. there are more people we can play it with. Yeah, exactly. Now, I don't know. Like, there might be something with Urban Shadows. We can get a hold of them and get an upgrade kit or something like that. I didn't dive into it. It was just a game that I know Sean's been kind of going nuts on the RPG Kickstarters lately. And I thought it was one that would catch his interest. Now, another one I want to give a shout out to is Freedom 5. A couple things this is doing. For one, it's based on the highly popular Sentinels of the Multiverse Universe, which I still want that RPG. This is a cooperative comic book board game. And what they have done, which I haven't seen on Kickstarter yet, is there are a couple different things. Custom meeples, but pre-painted miniatures. And I'm like, wow. So not only am I going to have like these things, the pictures I'm seeing of them look like Disney Infinity or, or um, the Spyro stuff you can buy. And I'm like, wow, that is an option is to get it. I got to admit, it's expensive. It's double the price of the, the original game. If you want the Sentinel edition with the pre-painted figures, you're, you're going to pay for it. Or maybe that's even the limited edition. 
where is the one that gives you the the pre-painted figures but i'm like that is really cool the other thing that's really impressive is arcane wonders is putting this out now everything sentinel comics in the past was like small little indie company oh i'm drawing a blank on who used to produce it it's not indie boards and cards now i'm drawing a blank on who used to produce sentinel comics so i don't know what happened there like with the license changing or anything else but like they have heroic scale miniatures they're 6.3 millimeters tall plus i love the sentinel comics universe the game looks interesting it looks well done no it's not the next marvel right it's not going to do as good as a marvel game or a dc game but there are fans of the series out there plus i enjoy playing unlicensed superhero stuff now and then too so again this is an honorable mention this is one i'm going to wait till it's out it's a brand new system we'll see how it does maybe it's something i'll pick up once it's uh once it's out on the market but it's one i'm definitely going to be watching excellent and then we're going to leave off with a light one that just looks neat because I like dexterity games way more than I probably should for being what I'd normally call a heavy gamer. I just, I don't know. I have a thing for dexterity games, things I get to touch and feel. And that is Kabuto Sumo. This just looks fascinating. It's you're putting these discs onto this like lily pad and you're trying to get ones to fall off. And it kind of reminds me of the, the ticket machine where you drop the coins in and it pushes other coins off. It, it's kind of using that mechanism. Game's only 30 bucks. It just looks neat. Uh, the, the art style is really cool. I don't know. There's something about this game. Like, I see it, and I'm like, I want that game. That just looks cool. I want to have this game. Yeah, they and they, I mean, they had a solid marketing push, too. Like, when that yeah. dropped, um, they there were waves of that game coming out. <laughs> yes. Just, just washing over Twitter. So, uh, that was definitely a solid one. All right, that's it from me for Kickstarter. Yeah, I haven't got, I mean, I'm waiting on some stuff. I've got some stuff in the pipeline, but uh, I don't want to necessarily shut out that because, well, you guys can't get that because it's, all, it's already closed and working on fulfilling and stuff like Worldwide Wrestling and Galaxy in Peril. Yeah, yeah, the latest edition of Worldwide Wrestling from Nathan D. Paylet. I am looking forward to that. Uh, that game is so much fun. I, that is just such a good game. And then what's another one is, um, I, I am still waiting for Anachrony. Anachrony, I don't know if it's COVID hit it or what, but that is one of the most delayed Kickstarters I've had in recent memory. Like in the past, having a Kickstarter be three years late it used to happen a little more often. Now I'm a little more discerning in what I back and people tend to get their stuff out late usually, but not that late. That one's taking its time. And to be honest, I want to look. What else am I backing? I don't think well, I Garinto. have anything else. <laughs> well, Garinto, yes. Yeah, we, we're aware of that one's not behind yet. That wasn't supposed to come out till next year. No, no. So. He's he's looking. He's they're, they're sounding good in time. I know one of the problems that's really been happening, um, I've got some of my technology ba- uh, projects that I'm backing, uh, are running late on delivery because they can't get into the factories yeah. to look at the prototypes. Um, like they just... The, they can't look at their prototypes because they can't get into mm-hmm. a factory in China. Um, even if they can get to China, they can't get into the factory. Yeah, they can't get stuff. Um, so uh, there's stuff like that that's going on. And I mean, prototype, you, you've got manufacturing issues with games too. So if you, if you might've been planning to fly over to China and inspect all your pieces before manufacturing, mm-hmm. now you've got to get it put on a slow boat, shift over to North America where you can inspect it, tell them it's wrong. send it. And back. then if it's wrong, yeah. <laughs> You know, yeah. not a fun uh, product production cycle in that case. Yeah. So Anacrity was due out in March this year. So that that's it's not a year behind yet, but I think it's going to hit there. Uh, Worldwide Wrestling, I am still waiting on. And that's it for stuff I back. Now, yes, there are like um, the new, um, oh, what's it called? I'm drawing a minute blank. Valeria game. Like yes. that, I should be getting a production copy. There's some stuff that we did Kickstarter previews for that the publishers are supposed to be providing us with official copies once they come out, and then we'll do a review of the, the full production version. But I don't have, this is the problem with that. I don't have a way to track those. Right. And I was telling Deanna that what I should start doing, plus it shows some support, is backing all of those at a buck. Right. And then making a note. So at least I see the updates and stuff. Because like, I honestly have no idea what's going on with Garinto. Like, I well, know see, it's coming. See, see, Garinto, I do know because I did that with. I yeah, backed you them. backed that one. I backed yeah. them for some bucks. I wasn't going to get the game because it's not something that's going to get played here. Uh, yeah. But you are getting a copy. And I just wanted to give them support because I yep. really love the game. No, that's totally fair. That's such a good game. So how are we doing? We we killed a, we talked a ton about Kickstarter. See, that's what I want to do. I want to deep dive a topic like that. Does anyone in the chat room, we we got 11 people in there. Come on, someone must have a gaming question. Uh, did I need to narrow it down again? Because last week we narrowed it down and I want I want questions about transitions. How about, I don't know. Well, we do have, transitions questions. About the we time do have questions that came in early on Discord today. Yeah, it's true. Plus um, one of the people who asked the questions is actually in the chat room. So absolutely. I don't think we have to repeat 
<laughs> have him ask again when we have a recording. Right. I'm used to having Jeff's questions in my back pocket without Jeff actually being present. So, <laughs> well, I was actually going to go with Math Guy Dave's question for okay. earlier today. So, what are the games that are at the top of your list to play once it's safe to play in public again? Like, what are you know? We know you've got some uh, some family gaming going on. You've got you know four adults who can play uh, occasionally. But uh, you know, what are those bigger names? Yeah, you know, bigger games that you might want to get out there that you just can't do right now. Well, the biggest one, which isn't really a play in public, so I want to get back to playing Gloomhaven with Tori and Kat. That's not playing in public. That's playing in my basement. But that's the one I think we miss the most. I We really enjoy hanging with Tori and Kat, meeting up early, going for dinner sometimes, meeting up on the weekend, uh, heading out to like the Sandwich Brew Pub, have a couple of drinks and some um, some charcuterie, and then heading back here and playing some games. And then our weekly Gloomhaven games. Those are the big ones. Uh, the other, I don't know, like... I, you know what? I just don't have anything off the top of my head, but I know if I look at our review games, there's like stuff we've reviewed that I know will be better with more players that we kept talking about. Um, CO2, I want to play with more people, but I'm not like in a rush to play that. Right. Um, trying to think, what have we reviewed recently? <laughs> I'm so like, many. I know there's stuff. I'm just like drawing a blank right now. Well, I mean, some of it would be uh, RPGs, right? You, well, yes. You know, we, don't, we aren't online RPGers. Uh, so getting those RPGs played is is tough. Uh, when you don't have that digital group already yeah. uh, set or easily set. But we did, we did do that one game we did, online. We it had, worked we pretty well. Game. Yep. It, and we probably should do it again. Yep. For some reason, I, I, I find it easier to dedicate my time to a physical game. Right. Whereas when I'm like, yeah, I don't know, sometime <laughs> we should play some games, some online somewhere with some people. I don't know when. Uh, um, Oh, why, why? Like, I, I just, I feel like I'm mental blind. This is bad for an AMA. I can't remember names of games. What else have we talked about recently? Like, the, the escape room games are not. Those are actually better two player. Um, I, this is bad. I feel bad. I should, you know what? You even had this in the notes earlier, and I didn't read. I didn't cheat and read ahead of time, and like prep any of this, which is I think obvious right now. Um, in general, it's just know what I miss. I miss playing a bunch of different games. Right. Like it's it's not a specific game. What I miss is going to easy mode or CG realm or a coffee shop or wherever or, uh, any local event may be and bringing a milk crate with six or seven different games and sitting down and like judging the crowd and deciding when to what to play based on the crowd. And, and one of the big things I miss is having other people there who are excited to play something. So I would have came out, like, say we were going this weekend, I probably, trying to think, what would I want to show off that we played the most? I can't show off Scooby-Doo, because it's just, I, that's what I want to show off. It's like, <laughs> here, I'll show you how Scooby-Doo works. We'll do a demo night and play through the first puzzle. Um, but like, here, hey, Coimbra. So Coimbra, D and I played, and we're like, man, this is good. But I can tell it'll be better with more players. So I bring Coimbra to play, and I grab the Robotech Force of Arms just to play it with someone other than Deanna because I want to review it to play it with some different people and be like, hey, cool, Robotech game with cool art. Sit down and play that, but then bring a copy of Imhotep and Horrified because it's this time of year, right? Like you got to bring If I was hosting any game event for the next this last month, I'd be bringing Horrified with me. And then a copy of Go Cuckoo in case Tech or Kevin shows up because he still hasn't had a chance to play Go Cuckoo. And then when we get there, have someone else show up and say, hey, did you bring Terraforming Mars and sit down and play that? Like, I just missed that five hours of dedicated gaming and switching what we play and getting in three or five games, depending on how long they are. And I think that's what I miss the most is that variety. It's like when we do our week in review now, it's like, yeah, I played the two games we were going to review because I needed to play them so we could review them. And that's kind of all we're doing right now. We're not getting in a lot of extra stuff. Nyctophobia. There's ah, there we go. I want to play Nyctophobia in public with other people. Not that my extended family was bad, but that's one I want to show off. I want to play that. And I want to play. I want to wear the dark oak glasses and do the spooky thing. That's an example of one of the ones. And Eclipse, Eclipse Second Dawn for the Galaxy. I've got this massive box I spent way too much money on that just, we tried it two player and like, nah. And that's, one, game and, with and that's one I'd love to be down there and, and yeah. you know, get in on. So there, I knew they were there. I knew they were in my head somewhere. Eclipse is the biggest. Eclipse, there. We're going to take back everything I said, unwind it, pull it all back in and say, no, Eclipse Second Dawn for the Galaxy with, a, I think it plays six It plays six or eight players. I can't remember now. Whatever the max player count is, give us 12 hours to do it. It shouldn't <laughs> take that long. 
it's not Twilight Imperium, but it might take us eight the first time. You know, have have like I don't know that unfortunately they're gone now. I was gonna say and have like the Windsor sandwich shop there so I can get a Coney dog part way through and take a break. Yep. Yeah, no, Eclipse Second Dawn for the Galaxies up there. Um the other 4X game that I have to review that I can't review because it's just not the kind of game that my mother-in-law is going to dive into um, burning suns, right? Which is something I have from Emil Larson that I interviewed back when he first kickstarted the game. That's another one. Um, I probably would have brought out flick wars, I think is another one. That's a, that's a get, I want to play a six player game of flick wars with lots of stuff going on the map with lots of, lots of scenery going on. Well, and on that big, on the big three by three table, I'm yes. uh... <laughs> assuming you can lift that mat up. I think you can. Yeah. Because that's a big thing for Flick Wars. Stuff, shoving stuff under the mat is right. what makes it so awesome. So, yes, there. There I found my actual answer. But even yeah. like Rituki. Like, Rituki is a party game. I want to be at easy mode with a, a pint of Walkerville Stout. And, you know, with uh, Roger sitting there and, and some gamers we never met before who came in to play Mario Kart. But were like, oh, what's going on? And sit down and play something like that. And uh, Jeff's pointing out he wants to get it, get that unmatched with uh, people who don't live in his house. And yeah, see, I want to try unmatched. Absolutely. That's the other thing. Uh, if I was, if I, I'd love to get down there and play a uh, play a game with you because again, I've watched it played, but I've never actually uh, gotten a chance to. So, and, and that's the other aspect of it too is getting to play games I don't have. Right now, my game collection is, has gotten become just the pile of obligation, right? Yeah. Like, yeah, I have some pile of shame stuff downstairs from before, but like I haven't been acquiring new games or trying new games, right? So I would love to get experience something new, right? So for example, Marvel Crisis Protocol. I know people locally are playing that game. That's, that's the new Fantasy Flight um, living card game based on the Marvel Universe. And people are going nuts for this. I don't really like living card games, so I'm not going to go buy that. But this might be the one for me. This might be my new magic, but I don't know that. So I need to see someone else playing it. Or the new Marvel Crisis Protocol, I think it is, the miniature game. There is a lot of games of that going on over at Solon's place, at Tabletop Renaissance. And I don't know who this local painter is, but he's got someone painting all his miniatures. Oh my God, do they look good. And I'm like, not a huge Marvel fan, but I'm a huge superhero fan. Like, I I don't care. Like, I guess I prefer Marvel to DC, but I'm like playing, like, I would love to see a good, superhero miniature game like because i haven't seen one yet i played a couple superhero miniature games and they were so so i would love to try that one and well maybe someone could convince me to um upgrade my x-wing ships and play second edition too if that was going on so yeah eclipse eclipse is the big one that that is the one like i kickstarted i spent a lot of money on that and when an acridity comes up i'm gonna feel the same way like it hasn't shown up yet but that's gonna be another huge box kickstarter game that's good with lots of people right are you getting um, Builders of Blankenburg, Fields and Flocks? I, we, we, we previewed it. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, don't, I don't remember if there was an agreement there to get the finished copy when the game came out. I, I honestly do not remember what our agreement was. I'd have to look that up. I just realized I, that was one because I had, I, had I had thrown a little bit of money at the failed one. Uh, yeah. and, then I, and then they restarted it and I didn't... Uh... I didn't yeah, to be honest, I, I didn't, don't know if I caught when they restarted it. Oh, okay. That's a neat game. Builders of Blanc, there's a hidden gem. Builders of Blankenberg. Fields of Flocks was okay. It was it was an interesting enough addition. Yep. All righty. Uh, All right, I think that that's two nice, good, solid ones. All right, so we got uh, a... Uh, uh, we're going to relate back to that first one a little bit with uh, okay, a question no from Pennywise. Uh, what did you think of GameFound? I, the best thing about game found is that Kickstarter has a competitor. That to me is the most important thing game found has done is become a viable alternative to Kickstarter, which I think is strongly needed to just, just for in the idea of, of uh, what free market ship, I don't know what, whatever you want to call it, free market economy. Like I, I don't want Kickstarter to have a monopoly and I am glad that more people are using it. Because I got to say, the other, I can't even remember the other one. There was another, Indiegogo right. seems to have kind of like, no one seems to be using that one anymore. Indiegogo seems to be the site you go to when Kickstarter bans your project or when you fail <laughs> on Kickstarter, so you try there. Or to scam people, because the thing on Indiegogo you can do is you can say, I take the money even if it doesn't fund. Right. Which to me just, I don't know, that seems... Nah, I would never back any project that says that unless it's like, you know, support this small kid to buy a trumpet for their band and learn how to play music or something. But as far as games are concerned, I like to me, that's a donation. You're not investing in anything at that point. Yeah. And, and from the, just a, a quick look at Indiegogo's uh, 
front page, they are very technologically oriented. Not the Kickstarter. Now, isn't. yeah. See, that's changed. Um, but but everything on uh, the, the the front page and their their what's cool and and top lists seems to be techno oriented. Okay. So I'm not even seeing. Uh, oh, there are some. Yeah, there is a. Okay, so tabletop games. What do they have for tabletop games? Um, there is. There. I mean, there is. There are tabletop games there, but uh, not. Not yeah. Escape room in a box. Puzzles, some uh, some app driven uh, board games. Yeah, there's there's yeah. stuff there, but not, there's stuff, not tons. Like some of the big ones, like like the the um, Hellboy role playing game and the Hellboy the board game were both funded through GameFound. GameFound to me looks legit. Like it looks like a good site. It's just games. It's way better to find interesting stuff like there's tags you can look at strategy games or deduction games or adventure games or just game components because these people are crowdfunding components there are actual games getting funded from what i understand it's more it's less north american centric than kickstarter okay so it's better for other countries like you're seeing french versions of games getting put out i like i said to me i haven't used it i have no opinion on I, I haven't researched what it costs to launch a project on GameFound if they charge more or less than Kickstarter. I have to assume less because Kickstarter charges a fortune, but maybe they charge more because it's a focused market. Right. I don't, I, it just, like I said, the biggest thing is it's a competitor. It's another source. It's not Kickstarter has all the eggs in their basket and it's not owned by Hasbro like uh, pulse, right? It's, it's not owned by a huge conglomerate, corporation that has millions of dollars and gets to decide which games are published and which aren't right it's still very independent and i appreciate that aspect of so it. game founder says that they are a free pledge manager so i'm not sure what there's god they must their take monetization something monetization is but uh yeah there must be be something but uh built four board gamers by board. i have to admit i had never heard of game found oh, okay that's actually this is tonight is the first i've ever seen there you it. go so uh it's thank you new. for Thank you for bringing that up, Pennywise, and uh, it's new something else to be on my list. I guess I've just never gotten caught up in a wave of, of advertising for that. Uh, yeah, that big before. games from them were Nemesis, which is a, an Aliens board game. Um, the other thing, too, is it does seem to be much more board game focused. Well, it's by, whereas, by, for, by, by board gamers for board gamers. Is how yeah, it's board described. game. Like, there are RPGs on it, but you definitely get more of the indie. You're not going to find um, a Thirsty Sword Lesbians on GameFound. It's just right. not the kind of thing. That what I also really like is itch.io. For, for if you want to talk indie RPGs, oh, I think yeah, itch.io is more important, bigger, and, and the biggest thing since The Forge. And I think is going to surpass. Uh, well, the problem is it's still niche. Yep. Once people learn, more people learn about it, I think it's going to blow up to be bigger than Kickstarter for yep. indie RPGs. Yep. The thing is, Kickstarter still got the numbers, right? So what you do is you create your game on itch.io right now. So you do your ash can and all the steps to get it done. And then you kickstart it to get the marketing. Yeah, absolutely. Seems to be the best way to put out an indie RPG nowadays. Yeah. And the true. best thing is, it's something we've talked about many times on the show is itch.io lets you fail first. It lets you fail forward. Yep. It lets you figure out that your game doesn't work before jumping to Kickstarter. Right. And there's also a real community there. So yes. there are discussion groups and things within the community to to have chats, uh, chats about things. So again, it's an alternative to, in some ways, to Facebook where you might not want to be getting into a Facebook group of designers who yep. in many cases may just be there to try and promote their own stuff, or you're in one where they're enforcing so many rules to try and prevent this, that, and the other thing. Itch.io is a little bit more of a free creator space yes. for that sort of thing. Which was very much designed for, again, like musicians, right? Like it, it, and, and video games. Yep. It, it's video games, especially indie video games, but the RPG community there is just exploded in a way because it's also now becoming an alternative to things like um indie press revolution and drive through rpg because they take less money right so like drive through again has the numbers it has the people on it because everyone knows that's the place you go for pdfs and now print on demand but it just doesn't charge as much yeah and i don't even know how i again i haven't done it i don't <laughs> have any games there I yet have yet to actually try to sell any of my games. So one of these days just dive into it, but that's another one of those things that takes time. Yeah, no, it's, it's, it's definitely something new. I mean, part of the problem is again, these services are newer. Uh, and so while right now they are charging less and, and, and taking less for yes. what they give, 
uh, at some point, monetization <sighs> issues generally mm-hmm. arise and people need to pay the bills. So, And to we'll, be honest, it's one of those things where someone will probably buy itch.io. Yeah, more That's than likely. what will probably happen. Uh, if we're, if we'll be lucky, might it buy. might be someone. Well, if, we're, if you're really lucky, it might be someone like Drive Through RPG who bought it and kept it as the indie as, wing of. Well, yeah. Drive-Thru to be RPG. honest, that's what happened because there used to be Drive Through RPG and there was RPG Now, right. and they were separate companies. And then one bookshelf, and I don't know if it was a merger or someone bought someone out. I don't know all the background there. That sounds like a, a bad ten car chat to me. Is <laughs> I'm sure there's a story behind it, but um, there was definitely two separate PDF companies out there, and they they have amalgamated somehow. Coco uh, Pelli, Coco Pelli is the latest Stefan Feld, so I'm excited about it because it's a Stefan Feld. That's interesting because um, I Google Coco Pelli and I get either a fertility deity or a bowl. So, uh, <laughs> well, uh, I'm sure it's about the fertility deity. Uh, that was that's just recently announced. What I am actually really kind of excited about, and I really hope Travis at Queen Games comes through for us, is the City series that was kickstarted. I don't think that's still on Kickstarter because I didn't back it, but that is a series of four Stefan Feld games, which are rethemes and remashings of his original games being redone so there's a newer version of bruges coming out and so on based on different cities and i'm really looking forward to that those i it, I, to be honest if i'm not able to get a uh, uh, review copies i'm looking forward to the queen games garage sale or yard sale that ends up on amazon eventually because i don't know what it is with queen games and their pricing on amazon but their games end up cheap eventually so but yeah, Steffenfeld, any new Steffenfeld games, I don't, I, I get excited about because it's a Steffenfeld game. Though I'm behind. I have not kept up with the latest Feld releases even close. I haven't, I haven't even seen Nova Luna except for a couple people playing it on a tabletop simulator during one of the online conventions. Right. All right. We got anything else crowdfunding? We might as well stick to the same topic if we have it. Um, not. I thought I saw something else. We have the C series. Okay, so Coco Pelli was there. I actually yeah. had the chat open for a minute. <laughs> um, yeah, not excited to sign up for one more service. I gotta agree that yep. there is that aspect. Though. There is so so. Red Meeple Ryan in the chat is saying the problem. In in a way, the problem with all these different services is having to sign up for all of them and having to keep track of them and and yet more services. I you know what? It, that's the toss up, right? Is, is you could have the monopoly that does it well and does it right and it's great. Or you can have the competition, which drives a monopoly to hopefully be better. And you got to kind of balance that, right? Like, I wish there was a competitor for Facebook out there because, man, I keep using that site. But it's the place you have to go because it's where the people are. And it's it's the only way to get some of your content seen nowadays because so many people use that site. So, you know, I well, I don't necessarily want to sign up for MeWe and YouMe Social and WT Social. I do because I keep hoping that one of them will you know, become the next G plus, to be honest, which is uh, like an actual competitor that hopefully the uh, host doesn't give up on. Before yeah. It gets, I, and cause, I mean, honestly, I'd love Google to, to be the next G plus, yeah, but I would, I would also that. be at the same time hesitant to dive into it. Well now. Yeah. Because of the Google graveyard. Yeah. So, and Google's done that problem all the time. So I don't know. I like, I get it. I get not wanting to sign up for anything else. To be honest, I am going to go wherever the coolest looking games are, right? Like, and, and the ones that I know, like if all of a sudden Queen Games and Stefan Feld starts using GameFound, I'll probably start buying games on GameFound. I'm, I'm going to chase the stuff that more than I'm going to care about the platform. Now, I'm not going to try some brand new site that no one's ever used before. Yeah, but now now these sites are all established, right? Indiegogo, GameFound. There's you others. jumped on Me Wee, so I think that was pretty close to. <laughs> uh, Me Wee still that of all of the Facebook alternatives, that is the one we get the most interaction on. That that is where we get a lot of our comments. Um, all of the Chris Groff comments, all of the Phil Hatfield comments, all of um, there's four or five Keith Davies. There's about s- names that come up often on our show right where people interact with this actually happens on me so because actually what happens solid is, engagement there yeah yeah we get solid engagement there that's where a lot of the gamers from gg plus went the problem is they when they first launched had some they were a little too willing to allow things on their site that people didn't want them to allow on their site they were they were trying to be an open impartial. and impartial community but when you do that in the current state of the world you get groups that just shouldn't exist period yep. online or otherwise yeah without diving too much into the political yes they were fence sitters 
and some people were not willing to go on to a site and support a site that were fence sitters. Yep. And to be honest, I don't know if they still feel that way. I haven't kept track. I, I don't know if that's still a problem. We've got our little group. We do our little thing. And it's not that little. It's it's a significant group. There's there's one group that's 38,000 gamers in it. So, like, right. it's not tiny, but it's not Facebook. Yeah. Yeah. yeah you don't have 4 billion people to, to, fit, to you know, pick from. No, I do. I me we me we is the best G plus alternative out there as long as you are okay with their hands off politics. Right, I think is probably the best way to word it. All right, um, all right. Uh, how long are we going? I haven't been watching the time as much I, I as you have. I haven't been as close. We're about an hour, you know, a little under an hour from the start of show. From the start, so we could probably do one more. We could probably do another uh, another question. I, I think we'll, we'll do one more. What we should do is we should cover Jeff's um, correction from our last AMA. Absolutely. Here we go. So uh, Jeff was watching the AMA and we got to his, got to his last AMA from uh, September. And he got yep. to his question about content, uh, about games versus people creating games. Now, the original question was, why do you think more people seem to find success making content about games than finding success making games, publishing games or running game stores? Right, but, where we we kind of went off on a whole. Yeah, we. I don't we, think they are. <laughs> we picked a direction. <laughs> what was our took? Off. Yeah, we picked yeah, a direction. We, and we ran off. So, uh, what what Jeff can see are people making game content on YouTube as a business. Uh, he gets the impression that Tom Vassell, Rotto, the Shut Up and Sit Down people, Mike Mercer, Will Wheaton with Tabletop, and stuff like that are far more financially successful than most game designers or small publishers, people, not companies. Uh, the guy behind designing Pandemic makes a modest full-time living, mm. but his is one of the most successful games on the market besides Catan. True. Most designers barely make enough to order a pizza a month on royalties is the impression that Jeff gets. Yeah, and I got to say, he's got to be right again. I don't know actual numbers, but they said the one I always saw, we mentioned Stefan Feld like 10 times tonight, so we're going to stick with Stefan Feld. Stefan Feld has a day job. That, that right there tells you almost everything you need to know about getting rich in the board game industry. It doesn't happen. Right. Like in, and again, I don't know, know how well Matt Leacock who designed pandemic does. There are game designers out there who have made it like your, your Friedman freeze, your Rainer Nitzias that they are out there. They do exist, but he's right in a way. But I, the thing is, it's, it's like, it's a 1% issue in a way it's, it's, there aren't like Jeff almost mentioned them all with Tom Vassal, Rado, shut up and sit down like that. Those are the big producers. I know some of the other people who produce content on YouTube and they don't like, they're not that big. There's no. um, well, Chaz and, Marler would be another one that should be up even, there. I mean, let's talk about Rado even, you know, Rado yeah. got his start by using, and we're going to loop this back to the earlier topic, Kickstarter. You yeah. know, he went on Kickstarter and said, look, I want to go and I want to go to Spiel. Go I want to buy these games. Yeah. I want to make this a thing and, and quit my day job. So here are some funding things. And, you know, if you fund me at this much, you get to be on the show with me. And if you fund me at this much, I will test your prototype games. Mm -hmm. um, and he had gone from a, you know, very much a, a hobbyist who was doing this, every, mm -hmm. you know, every once in a while for fun to making it a full-time job and got people to back like $18,000 for him in order to fund his career. Mm -hmm. But I mean, that's still, you know, that's still not really a lot of money when you look no. at a, a, you know, a year's salary or multiple years. Well, salary. That, that would supplement his YouTube income right. and any other income. he has. Well, and at the time, I don't think he was making any, any YouTube or any or very little YouTube income um, well, back yeah. in 2014 or 13 or whenever it was that uh, that Kickstarter happened. Mm -hmm. And that, that is actually a fair point because almost, I don't know about Rado or sorry, I don't know about shut up and sit down, but Tom Vassell is funded through a Kickstarter. Yeah. Tom Vassell runs a Kickstarter yeah. and that's what lets Tom do what he's doing. Now he already did it for years. And the biggest thing that changes now he has employees. So he was able to give his friends, basically saw a couple of his friends, full-time jobs through the Kickstarter, but he was also able to dedicate enough stuff. So they literally were making videos like unboxing videos. They're getting 10,000 views and not making enough to get by. Yeah. So I think there is a misconception in general by most people on how much YouTube pays you. Yeah. 
the, it really does not pay a lot. Like nowhere, nowhere near Tom Vassell's level or anything like that. And like, yes, you'll see the people sharing the fact they make a thousand dollars a day on YouTube, but those are mainly the people who make videos about how to make a thousand dollars a day on YouTube. And like, seriously, yeah. that's what works. It's, it's the same people who sell PDFs on how to create PDFs, right? Like it's, it, it's, it's ridiculous. It drives me nuts, but those are the things that get views or the views on um, uh, things that aren't cake. Right. Like uh, we watched a video about that where this Chinese production company produces a YouTube video every day and has won all these gold buttons. And all they do is they repeat the same 12 videos into different videos and they know how to SEO it well. Right. And now Jeff's pointing out, you know, he's not thinking they're getting rich, but are getting full time jobs. And again, I think what we're trying to point out here is, though, it's not really a full time job unless you get bring in income from elsewhere, unless you fight to do the Kickstarters for yourself. Right. Whereas a publisher can do a Kickstarter for their next game. Uh, you know, Tom's doing Kickstarters for him, his company, for his for business. Him, yes. For um, the Dice Tower. The, 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 the income from the content creation uh, isn't generally making it. Um, the people who may be making it a full time job uh, are in oftentimes maybe doing questionable things uh, the paid reviews, the, uh, you know, paid previews, the, and, and, other, and other things, uh, you know, not properly declaring whether or not you're whether or not you've been paid to yep. do things um there are there are certain issues about that and and ftc uh declarations and things that are going on uh you know people are hiding income and and mm-hmm. things like that so it it becomes a little more tricky i would say no nobody is really making a full-time job out of this uh with uh, you know just out of the content creation without going over and above and yeah. selling some sort of services. There are the rare few, but they're selling services. So an example of this is Lance Mixter, the Undead Viking. Lance Mixter, the Undead Viking, now works for game companies. So he now has a full-time job, but he has it in the game industry. Before that, he did videos. And where he got famous was he was one of the first people to do um, Kickstarter previews, where he would show off the game before it was produced. And I happen to know what he charged for those. And if he's putting out enough videos in a week, you can, you can live off that. He was living off that. Other content creator that manages to pull it off is Dyson Logos. Dyson Logos manages to not have to have a day job through Patreon by drawing maps. But Dyson Logos is one of the best map drawers on the damn planet. There, we just got our rating. I said, damn. (laughs) Uh, Our best map drawers on the planet. And now he's being hired by Wizards of the Coast to do maps because finally other people have recognized his style. But it took him forever to get there. So it happens. There are the ones that have done it. But like the example, the fact that Tom Vassell needs to run a, a Kickstarter to be able to fund it. The Secret Girl Gaming podcast about five years ago now did the same thing. So it was um, Jamie, the, the head of the Secret Cabal, was doing the podcast as a hobby. And then a lot of people kept asking him for more. Like, we love your content. We want more. We want more. And YouTube was starting to pick up and Twitch was becoming a thing. And like, we want more content for you. He's like, well, the only way I can do more content is to quit my job. And this doesn't pay enough to quit my job. And people encouraged him to run a Kickstarter. And it blew up the first year. Like, I actually think he made more the first year than a couple of years later because it was the first time doing it. But that was what let him take it to that next level. Now, I would almost suggest game designers do this. But then Martin Walls tried. Martin Wallace went and made his own company called Tree Frog Games that was only going to produce Martin Wallace games and he was going to kickstart them all and it failed. So I don't know. I, I just think there's less out there. Now, the exception also is you mentioned Mike Mercer and Will Wheaton. The thing is they're celebrities. They were celebrities before right. they started gaming online. They were already, I wouldn't say rich, but they were doing well enough and more importantly, had a following already. They had a group of invested people who were willing to give them money to produce more content. And and I mean, the fact of the matter is, if you are Will Wheaton, then if you make a YouTube channel, you are going to start with, say, 100,000 followers, which is something that most people take years and years and years to build up to. And with 100,000 followers, you're actually starting to see an income. Yes. Um, you know, you know, the guys who are making actual money on YouTube, on, on YouTube and just on YouTube content started about a million followers, um, to yeah. make, to make a really solid income. Um, mm-hmm. and, and the guys who are doing that are, you know, like the YouTube guys, if you look at a Hermitcraft player, which is again, my, you know, my, I've talked about them many times, my, my, my favorite Minecraft, uh, content creators, these guys are putting out two, three videos a week, not including stream content. Those videos are pl- are made by playing the g- playing Minecraft professionally 
six to 12 hours a day and editing that content into video and deleting all of the, the grindy stuff that nobody mm. wants to watch on YouTube and, you know, filming things with other, other content creators on the server in order to get a, you know, 20 minute, 40 minute video twice a week to keep their million followers happy. Uh, and then they have to stream on top of that and they have to tweet on top of that and, and, you know, so on and so forth. Uh, you know, pick how there are too many games that you're probably willing to pay play 50 to 60 hours a week. <laughs> yeah, there's none. I'm willing and to that's play and that's what they're many doing. hours I mean, a week. The, the guys who are the guys like the gaming people who are doing this professionally are playing those games a minimum of 50 to 60 hours a yeah. week. Some of them more. That's the other thing, too, that there's a lot of work that goes behind this, even like our small show compared to like to produce those tom vassal videos and those dice tower videos and the amount of yeah. work that goes into it and it, you get it, it, I, when you break it down into yeah. like I, I i do it i do the you know minimum wage in canada is 15 bucks an hour and i i work out d and i are not making 15 dollars an hour doing this and trust me our money's not coming for youtube that's for sure <laughs> yeah, no well, it, it's, there's, it's there's there's also i mean there's other costs especially you know for, uh, when you look at a game you know a game creator for content and they've got to buy their pc They've got the cop their one copy of the game or two copies of the game that they need. Uh, and then they're good for a year or two until they need they you know, something else. Whereas, you know, to get this running, we're look we're constantly looking at upgrading microphones, mm -hmm. cameras, lighting setups, sets, uh, new PCs to increase this stream, new mm -hmm. bandwidth to do this. You know, there are a lot of costs. And as you increase, you know, if we move all of our cameras up to 1080p. Soon enough, we're going to be having people ask, wonder, you know, expecting better because everyone else has moved Where's up to 4K, 4K or 12K or whatever else. You know, there are always ways that we can keep upgrading our video content because it's not video content of a game, right? It's not just the game shots. It's mm -hmm. it's us and and the product. So the other, I don't know, to be honest, I think it's actually more similar too. So looking at the both sides of it, right? So you look at the Tom Vassals and you compare those to the, the Martin Wallaces. And I think the thing is, it's the, it's way more work than you think. And you have to be constantly putting out content and that's how game designers are the same thing. Like you put out one game and even if it blows up, you're not getting much off that one game. You put out two games, you're getting a little more. You put out 20 games, assuming some of them become evergreen, right? That's why I'm saying like a Martin Wallace or a Steppenfeld right. where people are still playing the first game they ever published because it was that good has that. So that, that is, is a thing. Whereas the same thing with the content creator, you got to be constantly putting out videos. Now jump into YouTube making money. Sean and I and Deanna have been watching videos that on how to get more views, how to get more subscribers, right? What can we do to get it better? And you watch these and it blows my mind because people are like, well, if my video doesn't get 10,000 views in the first hour, that's a failure. And I delete the video. That was obviously a bad one. 10,000, we don't have all our videos combined. Like, yeah, we only been around two years, but like, I have a feeling even if I look at Tom Vassals, he doesn't have a lot of videos that have 10,000 views, even ones that have been up for a long time. Like, it yeah. just, it doesn't happen. We don't have any video. If you add up all our videos together, yes, because we have one extremely well-performing video, we can get the 10,000 views total <laughs> over all our videos. Yeah. But I mean, that's definitely a, a thing, right? Like, yep. like, well, this and, guy and Instagram. like successful, right? You 10,000 views in the first hour. And that is all based in this video was all because of his thumbnail. Yep. That's all that changed. It was a picture. It's why did this video work and this one not? And it had to do with his thumbnail. Yep. That was it. <laughs> Instagram, Instagram has the same sort of thing. You know, the, the, the big money people on Instagram who are getting the, the sponsorships and whatnot. Uh, you know, if they're, if that gram doesn't pr produce in that, in the first hour, yep. it's going away because yeah, it's, it's not content that, that's working. Yep. So I don't know. It's a thing. I, Jeff may be right overall. I, there may be more successful content creators than designers. I don't know. I, I like, again, we're, we're, we, I know some of the numbers for some of the people behind the scene. I happen to be in some Facebook groups where things like pricing and money gets discussed. I will say the average cost to do a Kickstarter preview video is $300 US, but that is a video not like we produce. That is a, a video where they spend two weeks filming right. stuff and B-rolls and sound effects and special right. effects and cards lighting up. And not, like, not like something well, you throw up on, you, on, on, on Twitch, a, right. a video produced for YouTube. Right. So you are looking at getting paid $300 to create an ad. And I got to say, 
hey, publishers, what a flipping deal compared to going to an advertising company. Oh, I mean, right? absolutely. I, I don't like, think... like 300 bucks is nothing when you're if, thinking if advertising I, budget. If, if Mo and I were living in the same city, there's a, a possibility we would be doing this sort of stuff yeah. because of my production background and, and Mo's uh, knowledge of, the, of that industry. But the problem is, I don't know how I could do videos for three hundred dollars. You know, I, right. you know, two weeks of your life for three hundred bucks. That's well, that's it. you got to be doing all the other yeah. stuff at the same time. It, it's <laughs> exactly. a constant hustle, to be honest, to, yeah. to keep it going. It, it's it's a constant hustle. It's it's sad, but that's where it is. And now part of this is people undervaluing the end product, but that is a totally different topic. Maybe we'll save for another AMA because at this point we hit ten thirty. And if nothing else, I need to take a quick break. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, that's it for this we, month's. What? Sorry. Do we have anything in the chat we want to summarize? I saw a whole bunch showing up while we were talking about that. And Jeff, is that close to your question? That's the main thing I'd like to know because we were trying to correct our, our conversation. I think part of that went where we went last time too. But um, yeah, I well, said, I, I, he Ryan's, may be right. Yeah. And Ryan's talking, you know, there's a lot of uh, whether or not you'll make your fortune designing games. Lots of prototyping conventions pre-pandemic that are well attended oh, yeah. by those who are wanting. Then that's part of the problem is, I mean, well, there's a million people who want to make content, who want to produce stuff. And, uh, you know, well, uh, on both sides, the, the game designers and the content creators, uh, like on YouTube, yes. there's a million of us on both sides. More than a million. <laughs> like, that, that's just it. Con like, we've talked about it before, right? And I this year is lower, but for one, for the pandemic, and two... There wasn't a bubble that burst, but there's a, there has been the effect that companies can no longer put out 10 games in a year. Uh, Stephen Bonacore, who's now retired, but who, when he worked for Stronghold Games, has talked about his diminishing returns on games because the market is flooded. At that point, it's literally at that point. There is no way. There was a point in time when I got into this hobby where I could theoretically play every game that was released near every hobby board game, every designer game, everything by Mayfair, Rio Grande Games, Edgar Spiel, all the big companies. I could play them all in a year. I may not want to, but I could. It could physically be done. That is impossible nowadays. It, it is. It's three thousand games. There aren't enough hours in the year to try every game that comes out. And then you have all these fish trying to get a piece of the pie right like pe fish getting a piece of the pie where am i those fish are interesting or that pie is uh <laughs> fish getting a piece uh. of the pie i don't even know i don't even know what i'm talking about you know what i mean though right like it's just yeah. there's so many people trying to design games because yeah. the amount and, of and money for games is not changed but the the number of people trying to take a bite out of that market yeah, is, uh, like, like it's the number yeah. of people. And, and it's the same thing with the content creator market, right? Like we got into podcasting late. We got into streaming fairly early. But like even since we've gotten to streaming, when you used to go to Twitch, I should try to test this right now. If I go to the board game category, I bet you there's more than three people streaming under board gaming. Oh, when sure. we first started podcasting two years ago, you would go to board ga gaming and you would see four streams, one of them us. Yep. And literally that's it. That's all the people talking about board gaming right now. I don't want to screw up Twitch by opening it, but <laughs> I'm wondering how many are on right now. Usually about 12 to 16. I mean, yeah. under the board like that's just in two years. Right. And that happens to be like Wednesday night, late at night, Eastern time. Right. Like I'm sure if you go to prime time, it'd be even worse. Yep. Yes. The orc and the pie. Thank you, Jamie. But yeah, in general, I, there, the, a lot of the, a lot of the content creators people think are doing extremely well are, are supporting the, it some other way, us included. I, we've said it many times. I'm not trying to hide the fact. Deanna and I, we make our money through affiliate links. We advertise products for gaming companies and mass, big mass market online retailers, and we get a small kickback for every game people buy. If it wasn't for that, we wouldn't be here right now. Or I, I, I'd be just getting off work and showing up and stressed out and have even more gray hair and be like, <laughs> I don't know. I didn't get a chance to do the notes tonight. So there, there are 300 about. people watching. Uh, 18 different board, including us, 18 different board game feeds. Wow, 300 is a, we have a significant piece of that pie. Yeah. Like 300 <laughs> people is not a lot. Nope. So. But that's it, right? It's... Like, like, like Ryan's frustrated by, it. I know he has been because so many people doing shows at this time every week, spread it out. The problem is if we were on Tuesday, you'd be saying the same thing because there'd be other people doing shows. I mean, we moved from Thursday because there were too well, many, well, I mean, critical critters, role. Uh, the critters yeah. were, would, would never watch us on, on Thursdays. So. Nope um you know, and we, we have a couple Wednesday. that watch us yeah sometimes um we have been asked to move to tuesday a couple times now 
but I just have a feeling if we move to Tuesday, there'd be people saying, why can't you be on Wednesday? Yeah. It's, it's right. I, like I honestly don't think we can win on that one, yeah. which is why you can watch this on YouTube at youtube.com slash tabletop. Absolutely. All well, right. At this thing point, I think we've wrapped up everything we got for the AMA. That was a good one. I liked it. We didn't get a lot of live questions, but we had backup questions from people in the chat. Yep. And I love the interaction we got once we started talking. Absolutely. So that's it for this month's AMA. Thank you to everyone who submitted a question. Those, those of you who missed any discussion, you can watch this sec segment at any time on YouTube. For those of you who that uh, we're here live, it will be going live. Our, for those of you here live, that will be going live on Sunday. Yes. Uh, no, actually, Saturday is when these it's go Saturday up. Now? Saturday now? I don't even AMA, know. Saturday is when the, the asks go up. And uh, that's a, I'm uh, getting confused. For the rest of you listening on the podcast, this will already be up on YouTube. Uh, and, and we, we don't even stored, know. And we have stored questions from this episode and other episodes that we didn't get to that may get answered on future AMAs. Yes. That, that if no one shows up next week, we'll be all good. <laughs> it's definitely cooler if people are here and we get to interact with you. And I'm glad we were able to clear up things for Jeff. Finally, if you've got a gaming or game night question for us, especially a nice big meaty topic we can dig into on a full podcast episode, head over to the website and click on Ask the Bellhop or just email me directly, questions at tabletopbellhop.com. We're about to take an early look at Chronicles of Crime 1400, the first game in the new Millennium series of app-driven murder mystery Invest, uh, mystery investigation games. Before we continue, we do need to take a moment to thank Lucky Duck Games for sending us an early review copy of Chronicles of Crime 1400. All right, Chronicles of Crime 1400 was designed by David Kersiel, Wojciech Grykowski, and it features some amazingly evocative artwork from Barbara Gobieska, Mateus Komada, Katrina Kasabuka, and Mateus Michalski. I apologize if I got any of those wrong. I tried. This is the first game in the new Millennium series of games that are standalone games set in different time periods using the system that was first introduced in Chronicles of Crime. This series was funded in Kickstarter, the Millennium series, in March just this year, 2020, where it funded on day one. Retail version will be published by Lucky Duck James and should be out by the end of the year. This is a standalone Coded Chronicles game that plays one to four players, though I could say one or more, to be honest. The more brains, the better in a way, with each investigation taking under two hours approximately. Now, the base game box includes five crimes to be solved, one of which is a shorter tutorial investigation. Now, each scenario is only meant to be played once. These are mysteries. These are generally murder mysteries, but there are some other, other, other crimes to be solved. And once you solve the crime, you know the solution. But unlike many of the other puzzle games we've reviewed here at Tabletop Bellhop, such as the Exit series of games, nothing is destroyed while playing, so your game remains playable after the fact, so you can then pass it on to someone else, sell it on the secondary market, or return to it once you've completely forgotten what happened in that first case. Well, for a look at what you get in the box, watch for our unboxing video, which will be live on YouTube November 2nd. Or for a complete listing, check out the full rev written review on the blog. Now, to keep things brief, I will just summarize here because I don't want to get into all the details, all the components. Most of what you get here are cards, cards of various sizes from big to small and a board, central board to put most of those cards on. There's location cards, people cards and item cards. All of this is stored in one of the nicest plastic box inserts that even comes with a lid, which means this card based game, you can actually store vertically on your shelves without having to worry about anything falling out or getting misplaced. Fans of uh, protecting their games with sleeves will be happy to note the insert appears to be, I didn't test it, designed to fit sleeve versions of the card because all of the spots are a little larger than the cards that are in them. More and more manufacturers are stepping up with the inserts, and I don't think that's a bad thing. Now, the first thing you need to do to play any of the Coded Chronicle games, including this one, is you need to get the Coded Chronicles app. Once you have the app, which is 100% free, you're going to pick the Chronicles of Crime 1400 entry and then slick select one of the crimes you wish to solve. When this game is released, there will be five crimes available, one including a tutorial and four full investigations. And it is expected, at least based on what Lucky Duck's done with the other Chronicles of Crime games, that there will be further crimes released through the app as downloadable content. 
So despite the contents of the box, this is very much a digital game mm. requiring a mobile device and an app, as well as content updates and provide and content provided by the publisher ongoing. Just one correction. You don't actually need a mobile device. You can actually get it on Windows and um, Apple as well. You can just play it on a PC. Uh, but it requires camera, correct? Uh, yeah, it must in some way. Right. So I, I know you can get it for Windows and Apple. <laughs> I obviously didn't try it. But yeah, it would require some form of camera somehow. Right. Yeah, you do have to be able to, to scan QR codes. So in Chronicles of Crime 1400, you are playing Abelard Laval, a knight sworn to King Charles the sixth, the beloved who lives in the city of Paris or Paris, however you want to go. Since you were a child, you've had prophetic dreams in which you see scenes of crimes being committed or even ones yet to be committed. You learned to use the skill to solve cases no one else could and quickly earned a reputation as the person to go to when there is a mystery that needs to be solved that no one else can. So, a late Middle Ages psychic detective under a king suffering from significant ongoing mental illness. While yeah, you that... called him called him King Charles the Beloved, he was in the second half of his career known as King Charles the Mad. <laughs> I'm just going with what's on the box. Similar to Watergate, I'm not actually aware of the Paris scandal of 1400. <laughs> So each crime in Chronicles of Crime 1400 starts with you waking up to one or more visions. These are represented by large vision cards that only have artwork on them. These are images that are going to hopefully help you in your investigation. After looking over these clues, the app will tell you where you are, what you know so far, and instruct you to put out various cards for locations, people, and items. People you know about are placed on the main board, whereas people you know not just about, but where they are, are placed at specific locations. Similarly, items you have in your position are placed on one part of the main board, while items you only know about the existence of are placed on another. So an interesting use of the zones there, as we discussed in a previous episode, one might expect <laughs> the player or players to take and hold the objects they had in their possession, rather than merely using just another portion of that board in front of you. Well, for one, I think this is due to the fact you're expected to be playing uh, with more than one person. Yes, you can play it one one person, but they expect it to play up to four. So you kind of want all the clues everywhere because everyone is playing the one character. It's not like you're each different investigator. It's a cooperative game. You're all controlling um, Abelard or, sorry, I forgot his name. Something Laval. I remember the last name was Laval. Yeah, Abelard. Abelard Laval. You're all controlling Abelard Laval together. So I think one of it is you want everything in the center of the table. So in whatever zone three or four, whichever that is, so that everyone can see it and everyone can interact with it. Plus, actually using the app takes two hands. You actually have to hold it over things and then also tap it. Like you have to hold down a button to scan. Well, I guess if you're really dexterous, you can do it one <laughs> hand. For me, it took two hands. So there's no way like one person could hold all the cards and still also scan stuff and look around the room, which we'll get to later. Interesting. All right. Well, so a pool of resources to work with, you know, makes yeah. a little more sense there. Now, solving the crime involves traveling to various locations and interviewing people at those locations. When interviewing people, you can ask them about other people and or items. Doing this will unlock more people, more items, and more locations. Each time you talk to someone about anything, five minutes of in-game time passes. And every time you travel, 20 minutes goes by. Now, sometimes things in the game, and I was blown away by this, will actually change based on time passing. For example, someone who is at a house at one point might now be out on the at, at an inn later. Or what people know may change if you interview them again, or have, they may have new things to say, or you might be able to interview them with new items because time has progressed during the investigation. So interesting and a very video game like mechanic with the time advancement and such, mm -hmm. uh, which is not surprising given these app driven aspects and the focus on the, you know, the app as that mm -hmm. control in the game. Yeah, what I liked about that is like all the previous exit games I've played have been static. It solved the puzzle and the puzzle stays the same no matter what. It was cool to see it adapt and change as you played. Now, all of this, we mentioned the app many times, is handled through this app, right? The Chronicles of Crime app is, is the, the, the killer app. It's, it's what you're doing to do all this. So to travel to a location, you scan the location's QR code. Once there, if you want to initiate an interview with a person, you scan that person. And then once you're talking to the person by scanning them, you then scan what you want to talk to them about. So you're going to ask them about different items or people by scanning the QR codes on those items and people. After each scan, you're going to read what the app says, and often it'll instruct you to pull out new 
cue cards or tell you where to, and tell you where to put them. So like, okay, you've heard about this person. He lives here. So put out the location for here and then put his card there. Or sometimes it'll be like, oh, there was a, a mugger in the, in the, the tavern, but he ran out the door and we don't know where he went. You put him in a different spot. So the cards uh, or the QR codes are essentially similar to clicking on a location or a person um, mm -hmm. in a, in a list as you get in a digital mystery game. So, you know, instead, instead of you can interview X, Y, Z, B, you, it's interview the, one of the five cards in front of you. Yep. Yeah, exactly. Well, now what you hear is you don't get multiple choice questions. So you don't like go talk to someone and you get five options. Instead, you have everything in front of you. You could scan to talk to them about. So right. it's, it's not quite like a, which way interface you'd expect from some video games. Right. Now, in addition to this, you can also scan a crime scene. You can look around a crime scene. Now, this uses VR for this part of the game. One player is going to take the device you're using, either the app or, or the computer. And now with the computer, what you do is you point and click. With a phone, you can actually play either in 3D, if you actually have the proper glasses for it, Google Cardboard, or you can actually, Chronicles of Crime has an expansion that comes with a little attachment for your phone and a bonus mission. Or partial 3D, where you, you just use the, uh, the gyroscope in your device to be able to look around. Or you can play in 2D, where you just swipe or click to look around the room. So you get all those options. While one player is looking around the crime scene, they're going to call out what they see. So it's going to be like, hey, I see a window. Oh, I see. Oh, wait, there's a crossbow in the corner. Oh, there's some blood and guts over here. And you're going to say what you say. The other characters, the other people playing, sorry, the other people playing are then going to be looking through the pile of item cards and pulling out anything you mentioned. Now, these clue cards are going to be vague. So you're not going to see crossbow. You're going to find ranged weapon. And you're not going to find cross or candles or Bible. You're going to find devotional objects. And this is done for one so that they can be reused in all kinds of different crimes. Makes sense. Now, and I think this is a really nice touch. And this is something that gives this whole app-driven aspect some real value, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. The ability to use that Google Cardboard you know, VR experience to really experience those surroundings is a fantastic touch, uh, making you sort of work for the clues, right? You mm -hmm. need to you need to use your eyes and, and experience the crime scene yep. in order to be able to succeed. And that's that's something you can't really get without, you know, that it's it's, it's different than hold mm -hmm. up this card. You look at it for 30 seconds and remember what's on. Yeah. It. No, exactly. And that, that is probably the neatest part about the game. And what's uh, I think worth noting that I did, didn't have written down here is this is not um, photorealistic. You were looking at a, a painted artwork. So it's not like it's overly gory. Yes, okay. there could be some blood and guts or whatever, but it's not it's nothing disturbing. You're not looking at a, at a 3D crime scene that's going to turn anyone's stomach. Right. They, this isn't photoreal. Yes. Gore. So the game basically continues like this, right? You're going to move about, talk to people, unlock clues until you think you've solved the crime. Now, no, you have to make this call. The game is not going to tell you you've got everything. It's time to solve it. You decide when it's ready. When you do that, you're going to do something in the app that says, I'm ready to solve the clue, the, the crime, and it's going to start asking you a bunch of questions. And then to answer these questions, you're going to scan things. So it's going to be like, who killed X? And in reply, you'd scan the card for the killer. And then you could be asked, yeah, where is Y hidden? And you'd scan the location that Y is hidden. I don't really don't want to spoil anything here, obviously. Plus, it's going to be different depending on which case you're done. Once you're done answering your answers and you're given a final score, you'll have like a rating X out of X. Like our first one, we did got 110 out of 110. After seeing your score, you then have the option of reading through the full solution to see if there's anything you missed. So you scan Colonel Mustard, then you scan the kitchen, and you scan the pipe wrench, yep. and it tells you how accurate your score was. Yeah, that's pretty much it. Now, before I get to my final thoughts on Chronicle Crime 1400, I do need to point out, I have not played the original. The original's popular. It's out there. There's, I think it won a bunch of awards. It looks kind of neat, but to be honest, it just didn't interest me. You're in... Um, you're in the UK, you're in London, you're playing a Bobby, and you don't have the prescience. I don't know, medieval just seemed way cooler to me. And I'm just not much for modern gaming, whereas once you threw this medieval veneer on here, I was like, oh, I'm all for it. I don't know why, but that's me. So this was my first experience with this franchise, and it's a unique app-based gameplay. I got to admit, I kind of want to go try the original already. Yeah, no, and it's, uh, you know, the original is a solid 7.8. And then, so, it, you know, this is certainly a strong recommendation, even before we get to the details of the yeah. game, that, hey, I've played this game, and before we get to our review, I want to go and play the other games in this series. No, seriously, like, <laughs> I really want to check it out. Because one of the things they did that's so brilliant is by having the generic things, you could tell so many different stories with it. 
So starting from the beginning, opening the box, I was impressed. The production quality here is, is top notch. The Chronicle Drive 1400 looks great. The rules are excellent. They were great for teaching the game. Lots of examples, not too long. It was only like seven pages. So it's one of those, I wouldn't feel bad cracking the shrink on this and reading it to the other three players in front of me before playing the first time. The box inserts I love. Like I seeing a card purse based game that I can store vertically is awesome. Not that I store my games vertically, but I know many people do. So that's a that's a great one. That is one of the best I've seen. And the art here is bang on. Like it it's very evocative. It's well drawn. It I love the art. And it's as good as anything I've seen in any other game. Like this this is one that, that could be up there for like when people have game of the year for artwork of the year, this should be a nominee if it's not, well, it's not out yet, but I'm, <laughs> I'm guessing in 2020, this might hit a, a artwork nominee for this year. Interesting. Now, as for the app based investigation system, which is the heart of this, I think it's brilliant. Like it's just such a unique and engaging way to create a mystery. It's not flipping through the book and reading the passages. Like you actually get this feel of having to talk to the right person about the right thing and note what they're saying and how they say it. And it's all about like teaching the lies and the subtle clues and presenting the right evidence at the right time. Like knowing that the guy is kind of hinting at this and you're like, oh, but here is the thing. And they're like, oh, you caught me. And they finally give in, right? You get all that feel of, of, of a true investigation. Overall, though, this does read leads to a rather immersive experience, except for one thing. I'm using an app, and it's supposed to be 1,400 France, and that just, there's something incongruous about that, right? Like, it just feels off. Plus, there's all the common issues that come up with trying to scan anything. Like, sometimes you don't get the angle right, and the lighting's not good, and you got to pick the card up, and sometimes you're not careful. You're holding a card in your hand, and you scan the one behind it, and you lose 20 minutes because you just traveled. You didn't want to travel, and there's no undo. All of that firmly takes you out of the moment of trying to solve a crime. Right. So here's where I need to ask the question. Uh, and I don't know if any of our listeners have, but this one came to me while I was sort of going through the original review on this is why is this a board game? While it's wonderful that they've gone into so much effort and, and put such fantastic art into it uh, and, and gone to all these components and the presentation, why is any of the physical material acquired? What does it sure. bring to the game that couldn't have just been handled in an app where instead of scanning the the kitchen you click the button that says kitchen mm -hmm. fair very fair question so i'm going to start off like going back to when we were talking about the zones of play right so one of the things that if you've ever played like um i'm trying to telltale games that's what these remind me of right point and click style adventures any of the telltale games those are single player experiences those are something you sit with your app and you play through your your tablet your phone whereas this is meant to be a multiplayer experience and that is something you're not going to be able to recreate with an app. And yes, I guess you pass the phone and you click the next two things and you click the next two things, right? You're not all going to be able to work on it at the same time. Now, one person's going to be doing the scanning, but everyone else can interact with the stuff, right? They're going to be able to pick up things and they can look at the vision cards. And then you're going to have a discussion with each other on what to do, right? Like, who should I talk to next? Or did you remember this fact? Or do you remember that's her husband? Oh, wait, I bet you the ring means they're cheating on each other or whatever. And that physicality is the next part of it, which is the fact that everything's laid out in front of you. Like you have all of the clues and all the locations and all of the people involved in front of you that you know at one time. So it's like, it's, it's almost like your game table becomes a cork board, right? Or a murder board with, there's no strings, but you've got everything kind of tied together. And I personally don't see how you could recreate that information in a usable way on an app. Like that just seems like one of the, like I'd zoom in, zoom out, I don't know. Plus you can manipulate it. So I can move this here, or put this there. When someone moves from this, when I know that someone's been murdered, I can then move them. And I know they're burying the body. I move the card to the, the, the graveyard location. And like, there's a physicality there that's, that would be missing from an app. And I think that is a good part of it. Two is you're touching things, the, the, the tactile thing. Now, maybe this is with me. We've talked about this before, how I cannot play the Onitama app or the Hive app, but you play me in the real game and I'm, I'm a killer at it. There's something about touching and moving things. It just has more permanence to me and it sticks in my head better. Just even things like while the player is looking around the room, the other player is shuffling through the clue cards, looking for the right object or being able to like pick up the person who's investigating and physically moving cards and stuff like that. All of that, I don't think you'd get with just a digital experience. 
All right. Well, I, I think honestly, yeah, that that kind of does sell me on tell me sold, <laughs> sell me on the differences. Um, the 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 physical manipulation of the objects yeah. is definitely something that I can't think of a game that's managed to reproduce. Uh, but doubling down, the group is aspect. Now, yeah. I mean, the group aspect I think is still a little odd because you are all playing one person. Yeah. So. Um, you know, not only is the king having psych psychotic episodes, <laughs> you've got four voices in your head. Yeah, Ab uh, Abelard Laval's got four voices in his head, yes. But uh, let's hear your final thoughts then. All right, overall, I think you can probably tell, just even by my manner of speaking here, I was really impressed by Chronicles of Crime 1400. Both uh, the physical components and, more importantly, the actual gameplay. This was a totally unique crime investigation experience for me. I And my family, right? Like we played four of us with my extended family and we all greatly enjoyed all our plays of the game so far. Like I, the, the system's just brilliant. Like I can't wait to play the rest of them in the box. And I'll admit, I haven't played them all. And to be honest, they haven't all even been written yet because <laughs> this was a Kickstarter that's not out yet. I can't even play all of them, but we haven't done them all, but I am looking forward to playing them and then checking out the other games in the Millennium series. Like one of them is going to be sci-fi. I don't, I don't have it in front of me. Like there's 1400 and I think there's 1900 or something like that. And then there's like 23 something. So that just looks really cool. And even though I, I modern, I don't know what it is. I, I, I live in modern times, so I don't want to play in that time period. Normally, I guess, isn't my thing. I am curious to check out Chronicles of Crime now. I honestly think if you dig that, that you know, by crime investigation that genre of that genre overall you need to check out this series of games whether it's 1400 the original series i don't think anyone who's a fan of mysteries and murder mysteries and any of that style of gameplay is going to be disappointed with the system even if you don't generally think those are the kind of games you enjoy that was me so you might want to check this out like the only thing that got me to try this is i'm like ah, medieval knight with prescience that sounds kind of neat if it wasn't for that, I wouldn't ever have tried this. And man, I would have messed out. This is the most fun I personally had with any of these style of games. All right. Well, for a much more in-depth look at Chronicles of Crime 1400, you can head over to tabletopbellhop.com and click on reviews. <laughs> Welcome to our spoiler-free review of The Shining Escape from the Overlook Hotel the second escape room escape room in a box style game using the coded chronicles <laughs> system before we get going i want to take a moment to thank the op for sending us a pre-release review copy of this game now just to make it clear we're the game we are talking about is the shining escape from the overlook hotel soon yep. to be released in november by the op and not just the shining released earlier this year by funko and designed by Prospero Hall, or the self-published Shining game from Matthew Natterhoft, released in 1998. Yes. I will personally note that the SEO uh, of whatever uh, search system that BGG implements uh, has really actually impressed me, because the first time we started talking about this game, if I typed The Shining into the BGG search engine, this game didn't come up. Mm -hmm. And now it's the third one on the list because I've been searching it regularly and other people have been searching it regularly <laughs> mm -hmm. as it comes up. So uh, it's, it's interesting that as the game becomes more popular, BGG starts recognizing it as a real game. Yes. Yeah, it was interesting because Sean's like, it's not on there. I'm like, it's number five for me. And that was yesterday. Yep. So it's moved from five to three yep. just overnight. All right, so The Shining Escape from the Overlook Hotel was designed by Jay Cormier and Sen Fung Lim, sometimes known as the Bambruzo Brothers, two awesome Canadian game designers. This is the same team that did the first Coded Chronicles game, which is Scooby-Doo Escape from the Haunted Mansion. Both of these games were published by The Op. This escape room in a box style board game plays one or more players, uh, literally says one to 999, split over to two acts. Now, Board Game Geek claims each act will take about 90 minutes. It took us significantly longer than that, though this was mainly due to issues we will discuss later. To see for yourself what you get in this puzzle-filled game, check out our unboxing video on YouTube. Don't worry, we don't spoil any of the puzzles, we just show off the first couple of cards and components that won't make any sense to you at all. 
and probably not. Now, in order to save some time tonight for a full breakdown of the components, you will have to check out the, the YouTube video or the written review on the blog. Just quickly, you get a rule book, four different clue books, a deck of clue cards, some room tiles, a couple standees, and a number of sealed envelopes. Now, what I will note here is I dig the work that went into theming these components. Like the envelopes are an Overlook Hotel envelope, like as if you were going to send a letter from this hotel that doesn't exist. And the books look like various journals. And I particularly liked Danny's composition book because I own many of those very, like it looks like a composition book. And I just thought that was a nice touch. So when we're looking uh, at components, uh, it's a very similar set to what we get with Scooby-Doo mm. with a different theme, obviously, where the Scooby-Doo Escape from Haunted Mansion, just with very different theming. Yes, very different theming. All right, to start off a game of The Shining Escape from the Overhooked Hotel, you're going to read a specific entry in one of the books. This entry sets the tone and also directs you to set up the first room and put one of the two characters in play. Now, the story here starts in media res, meaning like right in the middle of the action, and man, does it do a great job of ramping up the tension right from the start. How? Well, you're going to have to play to find out because I don't want to give anything away, but I will just say it was very well done for getting the mood and getting you go oh, into the oh my god right from the start now from here players will be working together using the characters who are present to interact with items in the room each character has two skills wendy can look and use danny can look and shine when using a skill what you do is you're going to place the character standy next to an item on the map and the items on the map are going to have two or three digits numbers on them. So to look in the drawer, you would put Wendy next to the drawer. You would look up her look number, which is one. You'd look up the drawer number, which is 203. I'm making up these numbers off the top of my head. And you would look up 1203 in the book and read it out to see what you've discovered. Reading entries in the book are often going to unlock new things in the form of clue cards being flipped over, sealed envelopes being opened, and doing this is going to add new rooms to the map and new things for you to interact with. So now I noticed that two uh, characters share a skill. Do they both use the same book for looking at things, or does it matter who looks at an item? Each character's look skill is completely different and each character has their own book. So what it is, is looking from a different perspective on things. And what's fascinating here for anyone who doesn't know the background is you are looking from an adult's perspective and a child's, which can be very important for finding clues. Now, unlike the other Coded Chronicles game, uh, there is a bit of a bit more mechanics, a little bit more fiddliness to this edition with Wendy's usability. It works a little differently. For Wendy's ability, you have to have discovered an item with a single digit number on it. This is generally something you'd carry around. Um, you're then gonna combine that number with a two digit object, either another item card on, or something on the map. And then the number of Wendy's use skill, which is two. So that again, gets you a four digit number that you'll look it up in the books to see what happens when you use that object with this other thing. Right. So it's actually a use X with Y as opposed to a use object. So you yes. can't use a door, but you can use a key with a door. Exactly. That's exactly the way it works. And the only way to use the skill is to combine things. Like you can't even use this skill on a three digit item in the game. Like there, there wouldn't be a way if the door is a three digit item, you wouldn't be able to use the door. Now, some entries will lead you, and this is another big difference from Scooby-Doo, to what the game calls unscripted endings. This means your group did something wrong. You had the wrong answer to a puzzle. You went the wrong way. You wasted too much time. Uh, again, for people who know the background, Jack caught you. Uh, you're going to record each time you get an unscripted ending and then go back and try something else. Right. Now, familiar uh, to anyone who used a bookmark to go back and try again in a which way book. But yeah. this time you have to keep score when you do it. Yes, exactly. That's exactly what it is. Now, in addition, and this is the, the, the closest I'm going to get to a spoiler tonight. There is a timing element to this game that's unlocked early. I'm not going to spoil it. I'm not going to tell you how it works or any more than that. But just know that there is a timing element that is going to give you an in added incentive not to waste time. And an additional penalty for when you try a code combination that isn't in a book. So when you go to try to use the door and it doesn't work because the knife in the door just doesn't get the door open, you need the key. Note this is in game. This isn't an actual physical timer. Like you're not, you're not putting on a timer or anything. This is in game time being spent. So unlike Scooby-Doo, you don't want to take the time to try out every potential combination no. as you're going along just to see what you get. 
Correct. Now, if you do get stuck on a puzzle, there on the back of the rule book, there's a list of the main puzzles in the game with entry numbers you can look up for clues. And there's a variable number of clues for each of the different puzzles. Now, while looking these up, there may be a penalty for looking or might not. What's good to see, in my opinion, this is the same thing that's in the exit games, is that if you look up a clue and it doesn't give you anything new, like if you already knew that the thing you had to do was to count the things and the clue says count the things, you're like, yeah, well, duh, then you don't get penalized. It's only when you say you have to count the things and, and you're like, oh, I didn't get the end, that's when it's going to count against you. Now that's it. You continue the game like this, exploring the Overlook Hotel, finding clues, solving puzzles, until hopefully you escape. At the end of the game, you're going to calculate a final score based on how many of those unscripted endings you've marked off during your play. Right. Now, interestingly, they, t- they call them unscripted endings. And I wonder how much of this uh, is related to the fact that film buffs will usually know that Kubrick took many liberties with this <laughs> film, uh, much to the dismay of Stephen King. And yeah. part of that was the ending. Now, there were also many other endings that were considered during the scripting process, uh, the writing of the screenplay, uh, that never made it to, uh, to film. But uh, there, it, there was a many branches that could have gone on to uh, celluloid mm-hmm. for this making of this movie. So while talking to Jay Cormier about this game, about which we'll talk a bit more in a little bit, this is meant to perfectly recreate the movie with them throwing in puzzles that make sense in the movie. So you are playing out the, the actual movie version, not the book version. And from what I understand, some of the unscripted endings were alternative endings. So, and that's why they go with it. And actually, when you read the books, it says the movie didn't end this way or something. I forget the actual words it uses. Okay. You, you can see that paragraph a lot, depending <laughs> on how, how you do things. Right. So one of the nice features of this game, again, carried over from Scooby-Doo, is that at the halfway point of the game, after solving about half the puzzles, the game gives you a chance to save the game. Here, the game goes through a quick cleanup where it's like, you don't need any of this anymore. Put it back in the box. And then here is what you have to have to go forward, which I think is really useful because it makes sure you didn't miss anything. Now, if there's anything you missed going forward, you're going to take unscripted ending penalties for anything you miss. So it's like, look, you need to have card six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11. You're like, Ooh, I never got 11. Well, you now get to get 11. You don't get to find out what you missed, but you get the clue you need to continue, but you got to take one of those penalties. Right now, as, uh, as people might remember, we did discover a slight problem in this aspect mm-hmm. of the game for the Scooby-Doo game. Uh, was it more complete for this one? I, all I can say right now is maybe <laughs> cause I'm not totally sure uh, a bit more about that in a little bit. So before I get into my thoughts on this game, I I do have to point out, first of all, um, how much I love Scooby-Doo, our entire family. We loved the first Code of Chronicles game. Like to me, that's, if it came out in 2019, it's a game of year 2019. If it came out in 2020, it deserves to win at least family game or kids game, something. It's got to win something. We were blown away by this. This was literally one of the best family gaming experience we've had together with the kids laughing out loud and excited to play and bouncing up and down like three-year-olds. It was insane how excited my kids got. The game was fantastic. Yes, there was a little, little twinge there. There was a little issue. But it wasn't game breaking and we had so much fun playing that. If it wasn't for how much I enjoyed that, I probably wouldn't have asked the op to review this one. Indeed. And I would say the review was quite glowing for (laughs) Scooby-Doo. And online, there was plenty of talk with the creators. Uh, I even jumped into a couple of threads about what other content would be a great Mm -hmm. match for this system. Now, one of the reasons this game probably wouldn't have entered me at all without playing Scooby-Doo is I've never read the book. I've never watched The Shining. It came out when I was five, and I just never, like, I didn't really watch horror movies growing up. I know literally nothing about it except Red Rum, All Work, No Play, and Here's Johnny. And I don't even know what those relate to. Like, I have no context. Those are just, like, cultural memes that are out there that I've heard. I know nothing what they mean at all. So... That leads me to my first problem with the Shining Escape from the Overlook Hotel. Though I don't know if it's necessarily a problem, but compared to Scooby-Doo, I I was familiar with Scooby-Doo, obviously. I grew up in the 80s. I know what Scooby-Doo was. 
But after playing that game, I didn't feel I needed to know Scooby-Doo. Yeah, I would have got some of the inside jokes. I would have not known what rut row means. And I would have understood why Scooby's, why Shaggy's always hungry or whatever. And, and as a perfect example is my kids know the bare minimum about the license. To the fact they were confused there was a talking dog. Like the first time Scooby talked, they're like, what? The dog could talk. That's how little they knew about Scooby-Doo. But we had zero problem engaging with that game. Any of us. Unfortunately, we didn't find the same thing here with The Shining. A uh, very licensed, knowledge-specific game. Now, I can't say I'm honestly surprised in this particular case. Um, and uh, I had been wondering earlier if you if it was based off the movie or used the book. And I guess Jay has cleared that yeah. up for us. So it is clearly the movie yes. in this case. It is the movie edition. Um, to be honest, it actually starts partway through the movie and references things that happened earlier in the movie, which was just confusing. Like, to be honest, people who know The Shining are going to know what I'm talking about. And people who don't are going to feel like I did when we started playing this game. Because the first Danny entry we read had some character named Tony talking. And Danny was talking to Tony, but there was only one person in the room. And I had no idea what was going on. There was no explanation of who Tony was. Now, after a few entries, we were able to kind of put together what was going on. But even then, we still weren't sure until after the fact. I now know a little bit more. And once mom got involved and whatever. And and like, I know the early puzzles would have made a lot more sense if we'd been familiar with Danny and his particular abilities, we'll just say. We had similar issues with some of the other characters, right? Like, why are we worried about Grady? I still don't know who Grady is or why we should be worried, but man, we had to be worried about Grady. Along with this, there was all kinds of things that referenced stuff that already happened. Like there's the thing from when she did this to Jack. And I'm like, when she did what? That happened in the movie before this game started. Like I, I at first I assumed this is what it was and now it's been confirmed. I talked to Jay and sure enough, this starts partway through the movie. So you're expected to know all the stuff leading up to this point. And no, the game is not unplayable without knowing the source material. Like we were able to complete the game. We played through it and we, we got the overall story, but it just felt like we were missing out on things. And we felt a bit lost during parts of the story because we weren't familiar with The Shining. Now, I, I, it's unfortunate, but at the same time, honestly, probably not something that's all that likely in the real world. Uh, yeah. It's, you know, I, I highly doubt that people who aren't familiar with the Shining are going to be in too much of a rush to go out and purchase something that is very much licensed IP content. I don't know about that just because of how good Scooby-Doo is. I think there's going to be a lot of people who play Scooby-Doo and then do like I do and go, man, that Coded Chronicle system's awesome. I want to try the next game, whether they know the license or not. Well, I mean, that's what I'd worry. Th those people might watch the movie first though. That's true. <laughs> and to be honest, I almost did. Right. Sean was actually the one that talked me out of it said, well, I'd rather hear in a review of if the game works without knowing the license. Because we almost we almost rented it online somehow. I, we found it for sale on one of the yeah, there's a, it's, 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 it's actually a, It's actually in movie theaters right now. Um, oh, it's, wow. It's a 40-year anniversary. Ah, uh, okay, there you go. Which makes sense why two board games for it came out <laughs> this year. All right, so that was one issue. We didn't know The Shining. It didn't ruin the game, though. That, that wasn't the biggest problem with it. The biggest problem was which thankfully is one the rest of you should not have to worry about whatsoever. So you're going to have to listen to all this and kind of forget it in a way, because it ends up the copy we got was an early review printing. And I am sorry to say had some serious issues. In particular, there were a few wrong entries as well as missing entries in the books. One of them being the first puzzle in the game. Literally the first puzzle you were to solve was missing the clue to solve it. I ended up having to flip through the clue deck to try to find a certain object only because I was able to read the answer that said, put this thing with this thing that we didn't have. Like one, like I had to find the card. Then I had to go through the book and I'm like, all right, I'm going to go through the book and find out how we should have got this card. It wasn't there. It didn't exist. There was no entry that would have ever led us to that clue. Instead, there was an entry we read that we were confused by but not too confused because we just thought it was another weird Danny thing. <laughs> I guess we we're like, I don't know, he's talking to someone else now, <laughs> right? That's how we thought it was. Having missing information, which led to an unsolvable puzzle, the first puzzle of the game, the game was as broken as Master of the Universe at that point. Like it was, 
you, you couldn't continue. Like we had to figure out a fix to let us progress. It just kind of ignored it. it. Went well, if these two things go together because the book says they go together, and we'll just keep playing. Right. Yeah. You never want to hear your game re referred to as just as bad as Masters of the Universe. Yes. Yeah. Uh, but it's a problem that one runs into with previews versus reviews. See, the problem that with that was this wasn't meant to be a preview as far as I knew. Like this was the first official printing of the game. I was supposedly getting a retail copy being sent out to reviewers. I had no idea I was getting anything different from what people would find in stores. Now, again, you can kind of throw all this out because I have confirmation from the op, that's the publisher, that this issue was noted by other reviewers. They got the information back to the op in time and they were able to fix it for the initial retail print run. So no one reading this should have to worry about this problem. However, I got to say, like, it kind of affected our feel of the entire game going forward. Which is completely understandable as an unplayable game is really hard not only to enjoy, but also to review. <laughs> yeah, it was interesting. So like I said, we managed to get past. We brute forced our way past the first puzzle, right? We basically skipped it and went, all right, we're done the first puzzle. Um, let's keep playing. And the rest of it went pretty well. Now, there were other problems. Now, this is going to affect everyone. The graphic design in this game, I would call questionable. Some of the text and writing on the cards is very small. Like, this isn't like background info on the cards or just pretty artwork. This is information that's required to solve some of the puzzles. We actually went and grabbed the magnifying glass after revealing the first couple clue cards to be able to make things out. Added to this is the, the 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 very deliberate choice of a very dark color scheme for the room and map cards. Some of these are so dark that it's hard to tell exactly what a number on the card is supposed to be. Like there's a number floating here, what's it mean? Both of these design issues combined made puzzles where you had to look for and count things on the various room cards needlessly difficult. Right, Well, and while I understand you want to build an aesthetic, it's also probably the case that there are fewer younger fans of a movie that came out 40 years ago. Yes. So aging eyes are a problem more so with a game like this than yeah. a game aimed at a younger audience. All right. My final complaint about the shiny escape from the overlooked hotel are many of the, the two digit items, right? We talked earlier about how Wendy has that use ability, which is meant to combine one object with a two digit object. The problem is we were having a real hard time telling what the things were. Like here we have a room with a ballroom and there's a number 23 on it that's just sitting on the floor. What is 23? And like I, I like I had literally no clue. Is that a window? Is it the carpet we're interacting with? What is 23? So like we're literally just grabbing something. Like like we can't look, right? So any other, anything else in the room, if it's a three-digit work, right? So if it was 123, we could use either of the characters to look at. And then you'd look up that entry and it would say, hey, I found a carpet on the floor. And it would make sense. But you couldn't look at the two-digit objects. So you just like fumbled around. You're like, I don't know what that is. Let's try using the knife. So let's look up 2823. And then you'd look it up and it'd be like, Jack comes at you with the ice pick. You're like, whoa, Jack, we haven't even seen Jack. What, what's going on? You're like, oh, obviously that's a wrong entry. So now we have to take a penalty because we couldn't tell what the thing on the map was. That was a little rough. Yeah, that's 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 unfortunate. And while I expect some of this can be chalked up to not knowing the source material, it is still problematic if they are leaning that heavily on the license. Yeah, and even without the license, like there's just stuff that like I don't think the carpet would have mattered. Maybe if you'd seen the movie, you'd know that corner of the room had something in it. I don't know. I think some of it was just art choices. There was a, a particular no, I don't want to spoil it. Never mind. <laughs> <laughs> so all right, that's a lot of negatives, I realize. Okay. I don't want people to get the idea that this was a horrible experience. Well, that gotta admit that misprinting issue. Don't worry about that. That'll be fixed. That in the final copy, you'll be all good. Except for that there was a lot to like here. This wasn't a terrible thing that we just, obviously we found some problems. The coded Chronicles system is still brilliant. Like, like, I don't know. These games do such a great job of feeling like exploring an area, wandering around and looking at different things and figuring out how to put them together to progress the story. That is still really well done. 
the story is bang on. Like, like it starts off with a bang. That in media res intro really sets the tone right from the start. You're like, you're not playing Scooby Doo here. You you are in a Stephen King horror. You you are you are in a very different place here with a very different tone, and it really ramped up the tension quickly. And then the tension only gets more intense once that timing mechanic gets in where you're like oh i don't want to keep looking at the things and i didn't want to just combine things randomly because there's a penalty for doing that you really feel like you don't have enough time you're on the run and that you want to be extra careful not to waste time in actions so it does seem like they've really definitely found the tone for mm-hmm. this game and, and and set that you know quite accurately no, I agree. Without knowing the movie, but knowing the general gist, right? Now, most of the puzzles, I got to say, were were bang on. Like, they were just difficult enough. Like, there were a couple that had a stump for a significant amount of time, but we managed to solve them working together. However, there was one puzzle that did completely stump us due to the fact we failed to find the clues necessary to solve it. Now, this was in Act 2, and as far as I know from Jay, there weren't any printing issues in the second act in our copy so i'm actually still waiting for a confirmation on the op on that because i'm not sure how we could have missed anything but because of this missing clue whether it's our fault or the games again i i i can't help but suspect the game after what happened in act one but let's say it's us we missed it that's fine we literally had to do the solve like not just we had to go past the clues and go right to the solution for this and it just happened to be the final puzzle and this is the it's, i'm, I'm going to start calling it the pandemic legacy experience because it's the same thing that kind of soured me on all of pandemic legacy is that our last month of december and pandemic legacy was such a poor game that it's kind of ruined the whole feel well, we kind of got that for this the last puzzle we solved as we escaped and and got out we had to look up the answers that was a little disappointing yeah unfortunately like a fine meal a good game can be ruined by that last bite gone sour yeah so back to positive things right um i thought the implementation of shine was very cool i still don't know exactly what shine's supposed to be but they did some neat stuff that we didn't see in scooby-doo so that was cool and it was actually neat stuff i haven't seen in any other escape room game either so i did cool work there for those who know what i'm talking about you know what i'm talking about um all the exploration item finding figuring out how to combine those items um the system basically works really well like i i dig all of that and it feels even more so than scooby-doo like one of those point and click adventures and i think that's a good thing like i'm not trying to say it's bad that it feels like i think it's phenomenal that they're able to recreate that feel of like games like mist or the the ones we were talking about earlier and i I can't remember the telltale series of games like i i like that i felt like i was playing seventh guest right and i think that's a cool thing and for the most part we enjoyed playing the shining uh escape from overlook hotel like most of the puzzles were just difficult enough for us to do it the story was exciting and engaging the system's brilliant like i I, no matter how i feel about this game i'm still looking forward to the next coded chronicles game which i really want to check out i want to see what they can do with this overall though i'm sure you can tell by now we didn't enjoy this one as much as scooby-doo scooby-doo just seemed tighter more focused better written and the mechanics just worked better it was less fiddly. We didn't find weird things. We were working up the wrong stuff and combining things the wrong way. Plus, it didn't assume any knowledge or require any knowledge of the source material, which in that, I think, steps it up a bit that way, that it's going to be more accessible for more people. There were many frustrating moments in The Shining. In particular, we found the U skill to be more annoying than neat. Like it was just too many times like, I don't know, try this with this. Oh, we take another penalty. I try this with this. Okay, how about you try this one, right? And then that combined with issues of not recognizing it, right? Like when we didn't even know what we were interacting with, like, yeah, I'm using a knife with something. And, and then that combined with the, the difficulty to read clues and, and hard to find stuff on the things. And then, well, of course, the printing issues with our copy of the game. Now, again, I I know this shouldn't affect most people, but I couldn't help that tainting our enjoyment of the game. We had a broken game. We had to kind of hack through to get through it. Now, I'm glad we played The Shining. Unfortunately, though, I can't give this one a very strong recommendation. Now, what I'm hearing from this is that if you are a fan of the film The Shining, you are going to find a lot to like in this escape room in a box game. It seems to do a great job of recreating the tension, the mystery, Mm -hmm. and the horror from the film. And this game could be a great way for fans of the movie 
to experience in a new, rather engaging way, as long as our eyesight's good enough. Yes. Bring a magnifying glass. Seriously, you're going to need one. Now, if you played Scooby-Doo Escape from Haunted Mansion and you really need to play another Coded Chronicles experience, give it a shot. Um, you're going to hopefully all the printing issues are fixed by now. Like according to the op, it should be all good. So that should mean you're going to have a better experience than we did. Like it's hard not to be negative on a game that was broken when we were playing it. Now, if you haven't tried a Coded Chronicles game and you're curious about them, I would start with Scooby-Doo. Even if you're not a huge Scooby-Doo fan, it's just, it's simpler, it's tighter, it's more fun. It's lighter, it's fluffier, the puzzles are a little easier, you're not going to get stumped, and there's no way to, like, lose, right? Where in this one, you can lose multiple times, like, there are dead ends, and then you have to back up and resave. You don't find that in Scooby-Doo. I would suggest giving Scooby-Doo a shot, and then if you love it, if you absolutely must have more Coded Chronicles, then maybe give this a shot. Well, for a more in-depth look at The Shining Escape from the Overlook Hotel, you can head over to TabletopBellhop.com and click on Reviews. And now, the Bellhops Tabletop, where we look back and summarize what's happened since we were last year. What games hit our tables? Every week, we like to take a look back at the games we played and the events we attended. Man, when's the last time we went to an event? We, we just cut that part <laughs> out of the notes. I, hopefully, we'll go to events again. Yeah. And any other cool gaming stuff that happens to be going on while we sit at home and play with each other. That didn't sound right. <laughs> All right, it really wasn't a big week for gaming for us. Um, we had planned to spend Saturday night gaming and playing some games, but you know what? Both of us were exhausted, and we went to bed early on a Saturday night when, like, we didn't not even all the kids were here. So, I don't know. It happens. It was nice. Uh, we got some sleep, much-needed sleep. Sunday, though, we did head over to Brenda and Holly's place, and we played some of the Chronicles of Crime we were talking about earlier in the Review Cop segment. I think we already pretty much covered that in depth. All I really want to add here is that both Holly and Brenda really enjoyed it and have already asked when we can get together to try one of the harder crimes. So I am looking forward to doing more fun investigating in 1400 Paris. And once again, uh, since the pandemic has struck, I'm sure my kids would actually happily lend you one of their uh, VR masks for, for oh. Google phones uh, to use in the game, uh, which would make it a, a fun little thing. But getting it down there would be, of course, yeah. problematic. Uh, it's a shame you don't properly get to experience that. I mean, looking around and using the the, the Facebook 360 mm. is is one thing, but having that you know that view in front of you and mm. nothing else but the room is uh, would be a fun uh, fun idea. I, I will admit, I don't know if I should allow Deanna to do that because even with the Facebook 360, she she almost walked into the stairs and something. So she wanted to wander around the room just using a <laughs> phone. So. We, we might not want to try that. And to be honest, I've actually contacted the local game store. I got a hold of Ian at the CG realm to see if they can get in the, uh, I forget what they call it, the, the VR expansion. Right. Because it does actually come with another mystery, which now, once I get that, I'm going to have to buy Chronicles of Crime now because I'm going to have a mystery for it and the 3D glasses. Right. It, it, assuming the price is right. I have, they haven't got back to me on a price, but looking online, it seemed to be very reasonable. Plus, I'm thinking it'd be a cool thing to just have for other yeah. Uses. Although I think that one is only just a, a set of glasses that keep your phone. Yeah, yeah. Distance. There's no. There's no. Yeah. Yeah. Just, whereas, whereas I've actually got. Uh, it's it's it looks like a um like an actual like VR helmet list. that you okay. drop your phone into the front of, and uh, it's actually got you know adjustments for distance so that you can compensate uh, for glasses on or off and things like right. that. Right. Yeah. No. No. This is just a, it's actually cardboard. Yeah. And it slides over and holds it you know, the right viewing distance. Yeah, I saw an image in the in the preview shot. And to be there. honest, I've been actually really tempted to just try it because I am really good at those magic eye things and I'm pretty sure I could do it without anything. <laughs> but I haven't actually done it yet because, well, it's going to take up time in game. Right. So I, I, like, I have to go to a crime we've already solved just right, to try it. Yeah, I'm yeah. pretty sure I could pull it off. All right. Uh, also this week, I did get in some BGA plays, not as much as usual. Um, I am playing the worst game of Terra Mystica I have ever played. Like this, this is the, like I messed up. I'm, I'm playing the cultists. I obviously had somehow had never played them before. And right from the start, like I, I've got no chance. I, I messed up. I did the wrong thing. I forgot exactly. I forgot. It's I, I even right now, when you get power, is it when you build or is it when people build next to you? And I mixed up which that was. So I did this thing expecting to get lots of power and got none. And, oh, I'm I'm screwed. Like, I am tempted to concede. But I don't think you can really do that in this game. Like, I know you can do it on Board Game Arena. But, like, I don't know what that would do to my stuff on the board. And then I wouldn't be next to people. And I wouldn't be generating power. 
And like, so I'm not, I don't want to actually do it, but man, this is, this is, oh, terrible game of Terra Mystica. Which, which might explain why I've been looking at this game and thinking I'm doing quite well and off to a strong start, but <laughs> only go. because apparently you goofed it up. But maybe, I don't know. I don't um, know. Maybe I don't even know if I'm next to you. No, like, that's see, how it's much actually, he's, he's the one next to me. So I don't oh, know. No, I, I no impact on you. You guys can do your own thing. Yeah. And I'm, I'm guessing I'm next to pale Kerr probably who's going to win anyway. Right. <laughs> so I don't know. That, that is the worst. I, that's terrible. Uh, it's frostbite and Eric in that one with us. Oh, Not I couldn't to, remember who was yeah. where. So. Yeah, it's, an, it's always always hard to tell. I forget who's in which game. Uh, other board game arena case, uh, plays include some more three-player clans of Caldonia. Uh, this is another one where I made an early mistake, and I don't know if I'm going to be able to recover from that one. I went through the first year and didn't get that free five bucks for taking a second contract, so... Ooh. I don't know if that's going to be enough to ruin it. I'm, I'm picking it up. It's getting a little better. Um, I got Race for the Galaxy going. Actually, I got a big military game going this time. Last time, man, know what I found in Race for the Galaxy? I play a lot of Race for the Galaxy now. And, like, I thought I knew the game well. I can't seem to get a trade consume to work to win a game yet. Hmm. Like, I, I just can't do it. It seems to all be based on getting the high point cards in your tableau and not actually worry about victory points at all. And that seems weird compared to my physical plays of the game. And I'm like, what am I missing? Because, like, I tried. I had, like, all the combos for rare goods last game, and I just could not get it to work. I, I was shocked. I mean, that last uh, Race for the Galaxy game, I'm not a good Race for the Galaxy player. Yeah. I will say that straight up. I do not. I have not played the game in person enough to really get a lot of it. Um, so I kind of fly, fly along and, and, and play, but I, I, I got on a roll this time and I stayed away from yeah. the military. I have a tendency to play military, military in the game and I avoided it that last game and ended up coming in second after Eric. So I did something right. And I'm trying to recreate there you something go. this time around. So what we're saying is neither of us actually know how to play race <laughs> for the galaxy. We just click on cards. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I actually had a really great experience yesterday, just yesterday, uh, where I had a real-time game or near real-time game of Carcassonne with Eric. Okay, cool. Um, which was a lovely surprise. Usually we're in a four-player or a three-player game, which honestly takes weeks to play oh. out. I mean, Carcassonne is a, is a lengthy game when you're waiting between turns for people in different time zones. Mm -hmm. uh, Eric, and, Eric and a lot of the players are out there out, uh, in the uh, you know Washington, Oregon mm -hmm. area. And so it's, it's a, we, we play on very different schedules a lot of the time. Uh, but it just so happened that I don't know if he didn't invite anyone or if everyone else bailed out, but we were both on and a game of cart <laughs> broke out and nice. we finished it all in one, uh, in one day, which was very nice. Very cool. Now, the rest of my gaming for this week has been trying to play The Shining and, well, emails and direct messages back and forth with the op and one of the designers due to issues with the printing I received. Um, as I'm sure you could tell from the review earlier, that's been rather frustrating. Like, I got to say, like, we probably should have put this one on hold. I don't know. I, I didn't know what to do with this. Like, it is hard to review a game when the copy you have is literally broken. But you know what's been fixed. Right. Like, I know no one else is going to have this problem. And what frustrated us isn't going to frustrate anyone else. But it's just like, how do I put myself in the mindset of, well, if that didn't happen, would I be having fun? Like, it's it's really difficult. Now, the op has, this is pretty cool of them, offered to send me a, a complete copy when when the game's done. But I'm kind of like, well, I've already played. What am I going to do with that? Like, I almost like, we, we were done Act 1. I'm like, maybe I even talked to Deanna about it. Maybe we won't do Act 2 until the new copy shows up. Right. But then they said they didn't think there was anything wrong in Act 2. But then I'm not sure. That one clue we missed for the final puzzle, I, I don't know, my fault or theirs. And like I said, the problem is, we then spent the rest of the game expecting it to be more broken. Like right. you just, you couldn't help it. It was like every time you got stuck, is it, are we stuck or is the game broken? And I just, you couldn't shake that feeling. So I feel kind of bad for my review on that one, but like, I also don't because the op didn't tell me I was getting a pre-release copy that may have problems with it, right. but I am really glad it got caught. Like, I feel a little bad for calling them out on Twitter, but at the time I'm like, someone might be sitting in an email right now saying, yes, ship it. And I wanted them to know as soon as possible, yep. don't hit ship it because you don't want this to hit the market. That would have ruined them. Like yep. Coded Chronicles, no one would be talking about a year from now because that one would have came out and you get stuck on the first puzzle. It would have been a huge flop. And I wanted to make sure to get a hold of someone right away. So I tweeted, I went on Facebook, I sent them board game geek message and I went in my Gmail. Like I tried four different ways to say, hey, what's going on here? This isn't right. Yeah, no, it's... Uh... It's definitely something. One thing, I, if you're going to get a full co box copy, one of the things that might be interesting is to now go watch the movie 
and sit yeah. down again and see if they see how different that experience is. Uh, I mean, obviously, you're going to be able well, to, the to puzzles blow through are some things. Be. The puzzles aren't going to be that difficult, but uh, you know, you'll have a little bit of a different experience as to how yeah. how things read to you, and you'll know better whether or not certain things make sense and whether mm. or not you can count all of the. I'm not going to talk about it here. Yeah, exactly. Items, um, from watching the movie or mm -hmm. if no it's still graphically a problem or something yeah no i agree though i gotta be admit when i'm tempted to get a sealed game that i've already played why would i open it like <laughs> like to me that's just like well that'll be so, a giveaway or yeah, an extra there, life gift or something yep. like i appreciate it i appreciate yeah. the op is going to send me a complete copy so i have a full copy of the game but it's kind of silly on a game you can only play once yeah so we'll see one of the things people have suggested and i think it is a good idea is I could then run an event publicly and game master it. Right. Cause I know the flaws. I know the problems. So I can guide people like, like you talked about with the, like physical escape rooms, right. Yep. Where you would have a guide there to say, you know what, you're pushing the right button. You just got to push harder. Yep. And, and be able to do that. I actually think that'd be enjoyable because I like that DM role. I've, I've enjoyed it for years in role-playing situations. I think it would be fun to, in, to do it. Though I think Deanna is better at the voices. So maybe I'll have her read the, <laughs> uh, the different paragraphs. And having now watched a couple clips of The Shining, I now understand what a couple things should sound like, I guess. Right. It's a way to put it. All right. Well, how about a look ahead? What do you have planned for the coming weeks? All right. So yet again, we are, we are, we're planning... We, we are have stuff planned and scheduled. So next week, we got a question from a patron of the show, Roger Malosh, uh, about classic trick-taking card games that is going to lead to some interesting discussions, something we're going to talk about. Now, this isn't a huge topic, so I think what we're going to do is we're going to sit there and we're going to talk about it, but then we are going to expand it and talk about some of the best modern trick-taking games. So it's going to be a kind of a, a combination episode where we're going to have a bit of discussion and some game recommendations. Now, along with that, I'm going to have reviews of Macaron, which is a new um, soon to be kickstarted trick-taking game and Ratuki. And yes, I know Ratuki is not trick-taking, but it's ladder based traditional card game. It's, it's that same traditional card game feel. Trust. Uh, come on. I'm trying to get the themes to match. It gets pretty good. It's got that traditional card game vibe. Now, along with that, Deanna and I keep talking about playing Pathfinder Adventure card game. We haven't done it yet. We got to do that. Um, that one's moving up in our review list. We're gonna, we're gonna, we're gonna pound that one out soon. I would like to play a few more games before then. So I'm hoping that'll happen sometime soon, maybe this weekend. Plus, I'm looking forward to get to more of those Robotech games, right? So we tried uh, Force of Arms. I would like to play. Well, Deanna in particular wants to play again because she misunderstood one of the concepts and kicked my butt, so that actually might be a knock against the game, is if you don't know what you're doing, you can win, that might be a, a bad thing. So I want to play that one again, and then I'm looking at trying the next game in the series, which is Crisis Point, which, from what I heard from someone today, is the same game brought to the nth level. So it's, again, I think it's going to be a big math grid thing, but on a bigger level scale with more counters. So I'm looking forward to checking that one out, too. Now a quick shout out and a thank you to some of our VIP guests, our Patreon backers. We greatly appreciate their support. Danielle Thomas. Thanks, Danielle. Sean P. Kelly. One of these days I will be free on a Monday and I'll join your live show. I get the notification and I'm always in the middle of something and I'm like, oh, I want to, but I should. I, I was burned out on Monday. I completely missed the notification and, uh, and didn't show up. And I have been really enjoying those shows lately. I, uh, I love those two guys. Andrew in, Dacey? in a purely platonic way. <laughs> Andrew Dacey, thank you. Uh, Diane Tuzano, thanks, Mom. Misdirected Mark, join the Misdirected Mark team every Tuesday night at 8 p.m. Eastern, uh, New York, Toronto, as they talk <laughs> games and game mastering at twitch.tv slash misdirectedmark. It's the not the Queen's time. <laughs> you know, we keep shouting that. We should be shouting out. Join gaming and BS on Monday nights. I don't even know when they we go should. live, I guess. Sean, we, give us give us a give us a spiel for your uh, yeah. Your I, the misdirected Mark one is is the same thing they say during yeah. their show. We 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 should totally be calling their out their show and when to see it because yeah, should. it's Monday nights. You can you can watch your Twitch. Go to gaming. I don't know what their Twitch is. Gaming BS gaming underscore. BS. I don't know. Sean keeps coming in here with a new tag every week. So yeah, I know <laughs> he keeps he keeps changing his name. He doesn't know what board games are. He's not welcome here anymore. <laughs> <laughs> All righty, moving on. Well, that was the double bell. That means my shift's coming to an end, and we're going to have to lock those front doors. Though the doors to the lobby are closed, you can always find us across the web and social media as Tabletop Bellhop, one word. Drop by our website at tabletopbellhop.com for more gaming content. 
Uh, if you dig what we've been doing, know what would be cool? If you chose to tip the bellhop at patreon.com slash tabletop bellhop. Yeah, remember to join us here on Twitch every Wednesday night at 9 p.m. New York trial time and watch for the Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast to hit your podcatchers and YouTube at 2 a.m. every Tuesday. Well, that about wraps up the time we have for the show tonight. For those of you here live, thank you for joining us and be sure to stick around and join us in the penthouse suite for the after show. For Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast, I'm Sean. And I'm Mo. Thank you. And, and game, game on. on.